So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And what we're going to do first is um, I'll share my screen. Okay, I'm going to move this out of the way. Okay, so I have a file open. Maybe I'll just show you this real quick. This is for the advanced class later. We're going to build, well, actually, I'm going to send out a model of the, a file with this model in it. There's just a simple dipole with a feed mine, and we're going to add a, a piece of coax conductor to this, simulating the outside of the shield. And then we're going to um, we'll move that around so we can see how it imbalances the dipole, the currents on the dipole. And then we're going to add a reflector and then a director and see what that does to the pattern. So that's coming up after 2 o'clock. No, after 3 o'clock. I'm sorry, after 3, right? Okay. Between good. 3 and 5, yeah. So at 3, we'll start on that. In the meantime, what we're going to do right now is we're going to start, we're going to do a model from scratch of a dipole. It'll be very simple. And um, so I go ahead and open, everybody open up four neck two. And we're going to choose in the end. first off in the settings make sure there's a check mark next to nec editor new like this there's another there are other ways to edit a file but we don't want to go there we're going to use the the new nec editor so make sure that's checked then go over to edit input Go to the file menu, choose new, and now we have an empty file. And we're going to save that with, um, call it whatever you want, call it class.nec. If I get ahead of anybody, just speak up. Where did you have the new file name? So I found the editor. Okay. Setting, yeah. input. Yeah. So settings. Set that to NEC editor new. Right. And then go to edit input file. Okay. And you'll get this window. Then you do file new. Oh, and it'll create an M, it'll clear the slate. Got and it. Then, and then go to file, save as. Find a place where you want to save that file. I'm calling it class.nec. And you know, name it whatever you want. I just want to make sure that we start with an empty file that has a name that you'll recognize. Okay, so um, we are. Hey, shut up. We're uh, and our antenna is made out of wires, so we're going to start in the geometry tab. <clears throat> we're uh, on line one. We're going to choose type wire. We're going to get a tag of one. I've been told tag can be anything, but um, it can, they can be out of sequence or anything. But uh, anyway, so call it tag one. We're going to give it 101 segments.
we'll do a 20 meter antenna. 20 meter antenna is um, 10 meters long at a half wave. Uh, this X1 is coordinate. This will be the starting coordinate of the wire. We're going to make it minus five meters. Y1 will be zero. Z1, we'll go ahead and put it at half a wavelength. So we'll make that five. X2 is going to be five. That'll be the right end of our wire. Y2 will be zero. Z2 will be five also. So it's five meters off the ground. Uh, radius for the wire, we're going to, we'll make this, um, I like 12 gauge wire. <laughs> so enter pound sign 12 there. And what, what happens is um, that's a wire gauge, an English, an American wire gauge number, but it'll be converted to meters. Hey, We're going to, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Are all our measurements automatically in meters? Is that our, yeah, that we're going to, when we created a new file, I think it set the default scaling to meters. See right here, it says scaling equals meters. Okay. And the other, a, the other the other question is is this a half meter uh, a half wavelength high or a full wave or a quarter wave well 20 meter it'd be a it'd be 10 meters up. wire half wave you're right yeah so we'll set that at yes so our z okay so, so and z, this is just basically coordinate axes x y and z right? right z1 and z2 should both be 10. Okay, um, now we're gonna go and we're gonna feed that wire. We're gonna give it, we're going to excite it. <laughs> and um, hang on, I'm looking. Okay. So our source is going to be voltage. Um, you, you probably won't be seeing this loads and trans lines down here. We'll get there later. Um, so type for source number one is voltage source. Tag. Okay, this is actually the, the wire that we're feeding. So we're using the same tag number as the wire and that's one. The segment we're gonna feed it on is 51. That'll be the center of the dipole. Um, real should be one. Let's see here. I, magnitude should be one, okay. So it should look like that. It's okay yeah. if there's it's okay if there's a zero in where it says image or imaginary. So okay. Um, now go over here where this disk icon is floppy disk, someday people don't even know what that is. <laughs> and click on that and that'll allow you to save your file. Um, the, this program's a little unpredictable, especially with a new user. Um, so you wanna save your work often so that you don't have to keep recreating this thing. Now that we've saved the file, is everybody caught up? That sounds like it. We're gonna click on this little calculator icon next to the disk icon. Hey, Gary. Yeah. Some, Kate, I don't One file, I don't know what that means. Uh, you, your, um, 
<clears throat> we're not Here. using example one, right? Example one? Yeah, I don't know what example one is. Where do you see example one? I don't know. Hey, uh, K, K, who's who's K Wing? Because I can't see everybody here. That's that's why I said every everybody. If you if you can, please put up your name, call sign, location. For yeah. uh, re replace replace your name with that so that. Yeah. I'll, we'll yeah. Go back. <clears throat> okay i'm so sorry i can't i can't find in a uh it, it wants a file to open if i don't click on a file it closes okay and i can't find a file to open i'll show you what to do sure well i'll go back sorry <laughs> yeah it's fine fine i want everybody to be able to follow along so we're going to go over this first part from beginning to end again because believe it or not in those few minutes, I created an antenna, and I want everybody to uh, enjoy their antenna. <laughs> it's these first steps that always elude me. <laughs> sure. I followed what you did. <laughs> yeah. So, um, could you add, if if you look, if you find your name on the screen right now, K Wing, click on the three dots in the upper right corner, and choose rename. You can, uh, there, yeah, there, the, there you go. There we that, go. That's very helpful. Yeah. Then we know, well, then it just makes it easier to talk to everybody. It's like a little sure. name tag, like a little Thank name you. tag when you go to the club meeting. Okay, great. So we're going to, um, I'm going to go ahead and share again and we're going to start from scratch. Okay. And yeah, okay, first off, you go to settings in the main menu. Make sure that you've selected NEC editor new. Yep, it's selected. Go to edit input file. I'll just close this so you can see what happens. <clears throat> Brings this up. Now you go file. Don't don't everybody do this. <laughs> If you if you're not sure what file you're in, it does not bring that screen up for me. So you you don't see this window. Correct. Okay. I do not. So make sure you do have NEC editor new. Oh yeah. Uh huh. I do. Okay. You go edit 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 input yeah. and input this, file F six yeah. And this doesn't show up. Correct. Okay, it's probably behind another window. That's what I was looking. I don't see it. Um, go down. Go down. There's a there's a file that says geometry F three, but it's it's open. It's blank. Yeah, close that's that. that's different. Yeah, yeah, you can close that. Okay. You just need F six. So, if you look down at your bottom bar. If you go down to your menu and when when I click on that, it brings up a, a window that says open file and there's no files in it. It's empty. It's and it's looking for an NEC input file dot NEC. Well, Gary, don't you have to create a new one? Well, yeah, that's why we went file new. Yeah, but I don't have that window right. to do it from. OK, so we're going to see if we can find that window. When I go down to my menu bar, I see if I hover over the NEC icon there, I see these windows. Do you I don't, see, I don't do you, have that either. Gary, I Gary, I just let him share. If you can, if you want to bring your screen up, you can. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'll, let me stop my share here. Whoops. I have the same problem. Okay, good. I, well, I, I, I have a comment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mine got lost. I am I'm running two windows and mine got lost in uh, Gary's uh, window and it was right there. It just I thought that was Gary's I'm, window and it was actually mine laying on top of it. Yeah, I'm moving things around. I don't see anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you want and to I share only, your screen? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Sure. Okay, go ahead. Uh, let me get to that. 
remember you got to share the whole screen so screen. if you have anything embarrassing on the screen take it down no <laughs> there we go okay now you see now you see what i got when i yeah. went to edit input you, how seat. many monitors do you have one just one okay yeah and, and then i get this i get this and it's looking for a file and, and i put in this new antenna.net but it does nothing right so yeah. there's does, no file yeah hit cancel up oh. <sighs> okay there is another way to create a file um okay i'm bringing it up again this is what I get when it comes up. See, I get what? this open failure here. Oh, well, that's not good. Uh, you know what? When you open it, try opening it as administrator. Okay, so one thing that can happen, this is really uh, unfortunate, <coughs> but this, this program has to be installed in a folder in the root of the C drive. Oh, in the C drive, because I put it in D. It has to be installed now. Uh, D, D might work, but there can't be any spaces in the in the path. There can't be any space characters in the path. Let me look on. Uh, get rid of this. Okay. Now, I think that dialog box. It always opens the last net file you had open. So I think it just can't find the previous thing he had open. That's why he's getting that error dialog. Yeah, you can't install it in program files. It has let to me, be. Let me reinstall in, in C. Okay. It, it doesn't take very long. I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody I'll else? Let me stop sharing then. No. I, 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 yeah, go ahead and stop sharing and I'll, and I will go through this again. And we'll just go over it until <laughs> everybody's up to speed. Let me get back so, to the um, Zoom screen. There it is. Is anybody Hello, else? Where to go? Is anybody else having this problem where? They can't, uh, yeah, go ahead and stop sharing. There, yeah, there yeah. you go. Is anybody else having this problem where they can't uh, find their files? No, I, I installed on D. And then okay. uh, when I was doing the on early tutorial, it couldn't find the file because right. it was yeah. on C. Yep. So once I knew I needed to look in the models on C or in D, then I could find everything at that point. But I don't know about the new one. Mine right. worked. Yeah, there is another way to do this, but um, the problem is that you can't have any spaces in the path. And the reason is that the, it's old. <laughs> the, the old program that actually does the calculations is written in Fortran. And when Fortran was around, there were no spaces. <laughs> when Fortran was around, there were only six character file names too, but Anyway, okay. um, I'm up now and I've got the file. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I liked Fortran. <clears throat> I, I learned Fortran in college. So hopefully on, pun it, on punch paper cards. Yeah, hopefully it'll it'll work when we go to calculate. If it doesn't calculate, then we're, you're going to have to install it in the root of C, not not in program files or anything else. So we'll 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 try that out. I'm going to go ahead and share. Come on. Oh. So, um, okay, so we're going to go to settings, make sure this is selected, edit input file, you'll get this window, go to file new. And you'll get an empty slate, you go to file save as, and it'll let you save I'm not going to save it because I want to reopen that file. Uh, I called it class.nec. And so far, we've populated one wire. And we've created a source. I'll go there. Ken, when you're done entering this, let me know. So just as a, just as a reference, the fact that it goes X, Y, Z, it should be noted that Z is always your vertical axis. And Z, if Z is zero, your antenna is laying on the ground. Right. So and an antenna on the ground won't work in this case because however, however, a source of like six inches above the ground can work. So <laughs> yeah, kind of because but the the ends of the wire would be attached to the um, to the ground. 
and you'd lose all your it's a it's a it's a good connection to ground yeah <laughs> you wouldn't be able to radiate but you know i guess part of it is that if you think of <clears throat> x and y as your horizontal plane you can put your x and y anywhere you can say you know if i have a five uh, let's say a 10 meter long piece of wire i can put it between negative five and plus five or i can put it from 10 to 20 or a thousand to 1010 but for simplicity's sake you know if you just consider the center of your antenna center of your antenna as kind of like zero zero if it's symmetric it makes things a little bit easier so the fee is always at zero it, it doesn't have to be i mean if you think no, of it it's like if you have a piece of wire that is off center fed, you know, and, and it goes from, let's say, minus five up to plus five, and it's off center fed, if this is zero, it could be over here. You could have, you know, multiple, multiple uh, sources, right? If you have multiple antennas, let's say you're doing a phased array, you know, let's say you have right. phased verticals, phased dipoles or something. Mm -hmm. depending on you know how many how many feed points you have you can actually have like a you know create a delay line or you can say it's another feed that's phased a certain number of degrees off right so the feed in this example was assumed to be zero someplace default yes. somewhere yes okay and um, the cool thing is that this th the software will actually show you the geometry that you create you created and sometimes you realize, yeah. oh, well, this is totally messed up. This, you know, this as is, soon as you see the picture. This is my antenna at this point. It's fed in the middle. That's the source. It's 101 segments long. It's, it's 10 meters long. It's 10 meters above the ground. And um, how do you get it to show the ground? Because mine doesn't show ground. It doesn't show this. Well, I, I have the antenna, but I don't have the ground. You zoom out, hit page down. When that window is selected, there we go. It's also a re view reset, and that'll also show everything. So if you ever get lost in this window, just go to view reset. Okay, now we have a we have geometry. That's our wire. We're feeding in the middle in this case, segment fifty one. We're going to set our frequency at 14.1. That's in the frequency ground tab. We're going to use real ground, which is the best it can do. <laughs> and there's a little checkbox here, connect wires for Z equals zero to ground. That's not going to be important right now, but but it might be someday. Um, so uh, should, you, should you select it or not? Yeah, select it. it okay. By default, I think it is selected. Yeah. So um, is any does anybody need more time or does anybody need me to go over this again? I had a question. Um, so I came in late. Yeah. So do you have this file somewhere? I can just load it up, load it up. Uh, no, it's, it's in a more finished state and I don't want you to see that, but if you, we can go through it one more time, it won't hurt. So, um, Robert, yeah, go just program, program running, go to settings, make sure NEC editor new. Wait, wait, uh, hold, hold on. Okay. Settings. NEC. Okay. Yep. Go I'm to, catching up too. So this is good. Thank you. Go to edit. Input file. You'll get a window. I've already got a file in there, so what do I do? Okay, so We're go file it. open. Choose file open. If you already have a file, if you don't it, already have a file, select new. Well, I, I want to get rid of the old one. Okay, and select new. Okay, in the. Wait. So select new file new that'll create an empty file and then do file save as i'm not getting hold on open save import exit i'm not getting a new option um okay so so you don't do you have this window up 
Uh, let's see. Uh, it's called or NEC2 edit. Uh, yeah, that has my old file in it. Right. So go to file menu. Oh, in that window. I was in the, sorry. I was in the wrong wrong window. Okay. Choose uh, new. Next was, okay. Then say. Then, then do file save as. When it says next file has changed, I'll, I'll just save the old one. Ah, okay. We're just giving it a name so you can save it easier later. Okay, so uh, file. You can write over the old file if you want. Okay. Uh, all right. File name is now. So I just. I call mine class.nec. Okay. Um, let's see. Class.nec. Okay. Save. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, in the geometry tab, mm -hmm. you should enter these numbers the type should be wire tag one segments 101 this is going to be a 20 meter antenna so we're going to make it 10 meters long and I, unfortunately i don't think there's a way to zoom in on that right oh. but but you, you can, if you maximize your screen and you like make the, uh, this is to all the users, if you maximize your screen and make the participant list and the chat as small as possible or make it go away, it'll maximize the screen view. Yeah. Wait, X2, zero. How do you decide on the number of segments? Well, you will, uh, you'll see in a minute why I chose 101. All right, thanks. <clears throat> Sometimes you make your geometry a certain number of segments because it makes it easy to attach things in certain places. You can only attach at vertices. So in this case, we're going to be feeding it at 51 which is right in the middle. We're gonna have 50 segments on the left of the feed point and 50 segments on the right of the feed, po feed point. And the feed point is gonna be the middle segment. That's why we're doing 101. Hey Gary, can I take over for one second? Sure, go ahead. Okay, I, I, I would mean, like to, yeah, I, I'm gonna share something real quick. Okay, let me sh unshare and, this. No, I got it. Okay. Okay, so what I just wanted to point out is if I draw this piece of wire, right? Let, let's make it as straight as I can. There we go. And we're going to feed it in the center. All right. So this is a dipole. And this is actually an automated version that we're doing of something that I did when I was in college, which is basically called piecewise approximation. So you essentially will take your antenna and you'll cut it into segments. And that's what we're doing. And if you look at the effect of the current that exists in every one of those segments at some point in space, what you then do is figure out what the current is on this segment. And this is calculated from the, the, the phasing and the feed and stuff like that. And what you then do is you run basically the math and say that from here to here, this is the contribution at that point in space. Then you do this one and say, this is the contribution at that point in space. And it repeats over and over and over and over for that one point in space from all of the segments that you've picked. Well, then what it then does is says, okay, well, we've got another point. Well, now obviously the distance to this point is different from here and from here and from here and so on and so forth. And wise approximation of the contribution of each wire segment, the current that's being carried on each segment at every point in space around this antenna. That is what, that is what this software does. 
we actually, when I was, when I was in college, this was in 19, spring of 1990 when I took an antennas class, we actually had to go through and do all of this using MATLAB or MathCAD. And to run a simple dipole with uh, 10 segments, um, it took a night. It took overnight. <laughs> so, so anyway, Scott, yes. At that point in space, uh, what's uh, what's there? So this is like a tensor field, right? So so it's, there you've got a a vector. You you just basically have the contribution of all the fields generated by each little segment of the antenna. So you're basically looking at the current and the uh, the electric and magnetic fields at all points in space. Okay. And, and that basically you pick it, it starts at one point in space. And then it says, okay, here it is at this point. Then you move and you move and you move and you move. And it's easy enough to do it at one point in space, but then you have all of space. You have a 360 degree sphere. You know, you have all those steradians to look at. So then it comes down to, you know, how, how much have you segmented out your sphere? So a segment represents uh, a, a portion of antenna from which to do the calculation. Yep. So it, it, you could, you might want to have a gazillion of them, but uh, you probably don't need that many. And the and the more the, the more segments you have, the better the approximation, you know, the better the calculation will be. But also the much, you know, the more segments you have, the longer it takes to run. Right. I see. And at some point, there's really no point to doing more because you know you're close enough. I mean, if you have a dipole and you put it in, cut it into eleven segments, you're going to be almost as good as if it's a hundred and one. So the number of segments is somewhat arbitrary, except for as what makes your, the way you piece it together more convenient. Like um, the other fellow was saying, he wants to do 50 on one side and 50 on the other and have a feed in the middle. So that's how you came up with 101. So. Right, and especially if I'm gonna be feeding something off center, and I know that I'm gonna be feeding it off center, I might say, okay, my segments are now numbers one through 101, and I'm gonna move my, I'm, and this is something that we're actually going to do wow. uh, okay. when we get to optimization and yeah. okay, variable, so. which you can call feed point, and then it'll move around based on how, you know, whether we want the pattern to be better or the SWR to be better. But that's, again, for the afternoon. That's for later. Thank you. Okay, so we, in the geometry tab, we have this one line. And in the source load tab, we have this one line. And um, and then uh, you got that, Robert? Have you entered that stuff? Uh, you're you're muted. Okay, now Darwin is speaking. Um, <laughs> voltage. So the type is voltage source. Okay. Oh, I see there's a drop down menu. Okay, great. There's, there's, a, there's a tag. Tag is one, which refers to the wire we entered earlier. Segment 51 is where we're going to feed. Um, Fornec 2 feeds, or NEC 2 feeds wire. Uh, at, it, it consumes a wire. Basically, a wire tells it where where to feed it, and it feeds off both ends of that wire. So one side's going to get fed from one end of that wire or that segment, and the other end of the antenna is going to get fed off the other end. Then uh, magnitude here should be one, real, and magnitude should be one. The rest of it's zero is okay. And then frequency should be 14.1 for now. And once you've gotten that far, you should click on the disk icon to save your changes. Now, you can close that. And if you look at your geometry F3 window, if it's not open, just hit F F3, you should see something like this.
My antenna is not floating above the Z. It's attached to the Z. Um, that's probably just scaling. If you hit page up or page down, see if it separates. Yes, it did. Yeah, so page up zooms in, page down zooms out. Okay. I know my soft keys don't seem to work. I can open by window by pulling window on the main and hit geometry F3 and I can get the image, but I my soft keys don't seem to be working. Ah, uh, yeah. If you're on a laptop, often there's a separate key called um, function or FN. You have to uh -huh. press that. You have to press that at the same time as your oh, okay. number, and that'll do the function keys. Okay, now we, if it looks like this, then we should be able to put some power into this thing and have it radiate. And what we're going to do now is we're going to, um, uh, this is a habit I want people to develop. You click the disk icon to save your work and you click this calculator icon to run NEC. And um, click, click on frequency sweep. This is like you're out there with a VNA check, checking this, the uh, impedance. And for your resolution here, enter one degree. Generally, it'll default to five. It's very coarse. It looks a lot better if you do one degree. It's also more accurate. Um, where it says frequency here, enter 14 to 14.35, and your step size should be 0.01. If you're on a really slow, slow computer, you can make that 0.1 instead. And um, once you've got all that entered, you click generate and it calls up this old Fortran program called NEC and um, it generates a pattern in the, in the pattern window and it shows you your SWR and impedance. Gary, how do I get that generate window? Um, when you're in the editor, you click the on- Editor, the, okay. When you're in the editor, you click on this little calculator icon. Oh, it. Oh, I see. Okay. I'm trying to develop, get people to follow that habit. You okay. save your work, then you click on the calculator because there's a lot of, you can lose your work really easily. Click on frequency sweep, Okay. resolution one degree, frequency start 14, stop 14.35, and step 0.01. Click on generate. It runs the it runs the NEC program on your input and generates output, which Fornec two then inter interprets and puts up on your screen as as the result of your um, computer run. Over on the left here, in the bottom left corner, I have a pattern window open. You can bring that up with F four if it's not already open. And it shows looking from the side of the antenna. Well, actually it shows looking lengthwise on the antenna. Um, and it also opens up this F5 window called gain SWR impedance. And the top graph here is our SWR and our bottom graph is reflection coefficient Think of it as return loss. Um, you can show other things in this window like gain and front to back. We aren't gonna have any front and back on difference on this. And you can also graph the impedance. Most people are just gonna be working with the SWR. Now, when I look at this graph of SWR, what I see is that my antenna is too short. If I made the antenna longer, the, the dip in the SWR would be closer to my target frequency of 14.1. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what we're going to do instead of shortening this wire, I'm going to show you the, um, the influence of making this wire out of copper instead of magic, no loss material. Our wire is not super conductive. So we're going to make it out of copper. There's a, a little checkbox here called show loads. Click on that. <clears throat> and here, for, for a load, we're going to do wire conductivity. We're going to do wire one. Uh, we can leave, actually, let's just leave that blank. Don't enter anything for tag number. If you, if you have to, you can use zero. There is no wire named zero and it knows what that means. It means every wire in the model. <laughs> and then for conductivity S, choose copper. By default, it, it makes everything perfect. It makes everything perfect and it makes it, um, you know, there's no loss, but we're gonna make copper because that's the cheapest thing we can find that conducts pretty well down at the hardware store. Okay, now we're going to save our file. And we're going to hit the calculator button. And we're going to do a frequency sweep again. And um, making out of copper has, has effectively lengthened the wire some. It's, it's, this has come down a little bit. We're going to do some more now. We're going to go back to our edit editor and we're going to add another load in line two. And this is going to be called wire coat. We'll leave tag blank again for dielectric C. We're going to use uh, PVC soft. This is this would be whatever kind of wire coat you have on your on your wire. For radius, we're going to do pound sign twelve plus point zero zero one. What that does is it creates a one millimeter coat on our number twelve wire. You have to do it that way. You can't just enter 0 0.001. If you do 0 0.001, it'll be inside the wire. This, mo this uh, program calculates based on surfaces only. And all, all the radii here, the wire radius and the wire coat radius is the outside surface of the, uh, of the insulation. So it has to be number 12 plus 0 0.001. I'm going to save that. I'm going to hit the calculator again. Can you pause there for a second? Sure. On your generate screen, because on your your plot came up looking a little bit different from mine. So I want to see. I mean, it's very similar, but uh, yeah, so, whereas so yours mine. was lower in the middle, mine was mine was more potato, whereas yours was uh, bow tie. Yeah, my, mine was also. Oh, okay. I don't see any differences. So, is yeah, that you, theta in the fee? Um, in this case, no. In this case, no. Um, in this case, no. So, generate. Oh, look at that. Our wire got a lot longer. Notice that we didn't we didn't change the wire geometry at all. All we did was make it out of copper instead of superconducting material and we put insulation on it and our wire is now effectively longer that's where there's a term called velocity factor that's where that comes from our velocity factor is now who knows what well um, let me see where we're at time wise 
Oh, what is that series comp parallel comp in the upper left window? 4,000 picofarads, 6.5 puff. Yeah. Um, serial series. Because those numbers are different from mine. I wonder if maybe that's what changes the pattern. Well, it's not something you can enter. This is calculated. Well, maybe um, it's set somewhere else. Um, yeah, I'm not. I can't remember what that is. Yeah, one he of, has. He one, is better. Better copper. Yeah, one of the nice things about this program <laughs> is it knows the program knows all that stuff that 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 most of us don't know, and um, so in a way, the program is the teacher. And um, so we can um, so we can learn so much just by understanding what all this stuff means. Gary, the yeah. um, main fourteen point one frequency. Yeah. What effect does that have versus the sweep? Okay, so um, when we entered that, right. So in this case, we're not, uh, I'll show you where that is used. If we go to, if we, if we go back to this um, calculator icon, instead of choosing frequency sweep, we can choose far field pattern. There's the 14 one, yeah. And it pulls it from there. Um, there are other places where it can be used. I'm going to go ahead and generate so you can see what this does. And we'll get back. So here, it looks like nothing has changed. But now we can open a window called 3D Viewer F9. There, there actually is, there are some other changes. But I'll, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. So. I'm going to show you this window real quick and just show you what you can see here. There's a drop down here called structure. You can change that to currents. And um, you can also change magnitude to phase and magnitude. And this is important if you have an antenna that's phased with another conductor. If you have multiple wires that are you're trying to phase together, um, that actually it, it shows the relationship of the phase. So, um, so I wanted to just show you a place where fourteen point one megahertz mm -hmm. is used. Is pulled from. Yep. Um, since I did the the um, since I did the far field pattern, you can go down here in the pattern view and say show both horizontal and vertical. And it shows it shows a vertical pattern view as well as the horizontal. Now, um, yeah, I haven't been showing you all the stuff. So anyway, see this blue line here? I can click on that. And as I drag my mouse along it, it's showing, it, notice that the vertical pattern is changing. It's actually showing the, the vertical pattern through that point on the horizontal pattern. So um, that's what that's about. See up here, it's turning more circular. Down here, it's turning more dog bone. So, um, it's also, if I leave my, when I stop here, it actually shows the, uh, the theta angle and the phi angle. You see, as I drag this around, it's showing, it's changing the theta down at the bottom. Gary, how do I get that red thing to show? Go to far field, show both vertical, horizontal and vertical. Show both. Ah, okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, 
that's showing your pattern at various points, various heights off the ground, essentially. And if you look over in the three in the geometry window, the F3 window, you'll see it, ac it actually sh shows the line through my mouse point pointer. I'll, hey. I'll rotate this a little bit so you can see that better. Hey, Gary. Yeah. So did you see in chat from KK from Jake? I lost the thread while I looked for the editor. So I missed the parameter that sets the wire material to copper. Can you show it? Okay. Yep. So here's the editor window. And go to, okay, it, it's a load. Um, this editor is kind of funky. It's, you notice I lost line one here. Well, I can go over here and just scroll up and I'll All see right. line one again. So this should be wire conductivity and this should be wire code. I probably accidentally changed that just now. And so the dielectric constant for copper is some number and we're not exposing that right here. It's actually 58 million. So when I set this, to copper, it's, it's using a, a number of 58 million for the conductivity of copper. Wire coat, when I set this at PVC soft, it enters a number of, uh, 4.5. That's for the dielectric constant of PVC. So, um, and here I, I had to enter number 12 plus 0 0.001, which is one millimeter thickness. Gary, question? Yeah? Is there an undo command in the editor? I know. <laughs> okay. That's one of the problems with it. So I'll show you there where is, I, There is a delete, right? Delete yeah, button. you can delete a line. You can copy a line to another line. That's something. This is how I actually edit this stuff. I use a text editor because then I can copy and paste and I don't, you know, when I click in the wrong place, I don't lose what I entered. Um, so, um, you can enter comments over here. You could say source. Well, that's pretty evident, self-evident. You could say conduct conductor, you say geometry, you say dipole. We'll get into more fancy stuff later, but I wanted to expose you to the interface first. Um, so I'm showing you the windows and all that. Hey, Gary. Um, yeah. So. Hey guys, I got a problem. When I hit the calculator key now, I get a field four not found in LD5.0, separator equal, error. Tell me again. I got a field four not found in LD5.0, and in parentheses it says separator equal. Okay, so look on your loads. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Okay, you have the first line is copper, the conductivity is copper. Basically, um, when you set this over here, it, it determines what, how to interpret the rest of the line. And for instance, wire coat expects this radius here for the wire coat, well actually conductivity does too. You can go ahead and, oh, okay, that's interesting. So yeah, so that's fine. And that's what I have over there. I have wire conductivity in the first line now. Okay, did you enter copper for? Okay, yeah, I got that there. Right. 
You okay now? Click save. Yeah, Stop. I'm alive. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. Question. Yep. On loads, you had a soft PVC. I'm yeah. wondering what is, I mean, they don't, uh, they don't have anything like fiberglass or something that might be normal. Yeah, window glass, <laughs> fiberglass. So insulation. Oh, they do um, have glass here? They have window glass. I, I think that's what that means. And you can also use wood, <laughs> styrofoam. Petri Petri no, styrofoam. if you want to try, if you want to try something fun, try changing the insulation diameter oh. from from number twelve plus point oh oh one to number twelve plus point oh oh two. It actually <laughs> pulls the resonant frequency by two hundred kilohertz. Yeah. So um, so what we've done so far is so you have to create a real simple quick model and um, we haven't gotten into symbols at all. I'm going to touch on that right away. We've, we've created a wire, we've created a source load, created a frequency and defined our ground. You can also make this free space, which is practically useless. I mean, it's not really in a theoretical sense or if you're working on the space station or whatever, but um, Okay, I'm going to introduce you now to symbols. We're going to create a symbol here called frequency equals 14.1. And if I hit tab twice, it takes me down to the next line. And as I said, this is very confusing because we just lost line number one. We're going to calculate the wavelength uh, at that frequency. The way we do that is we go frequency divided by 299. This is the way I did it. 792. Four, five, eight, and I only do this this accurately because well, actually I got it backwards. It's two nine nine. Of course, it's the speed of light divided by. Could you just use three hundred? You can, but one of the things I noticed is that if you're trying to figure out what you're seeing, it's better to do it this way because. This is the number that Fornec2 uses. And so you, things will start making a little more sense. Okay, so this is, this is our wavelength in, in free space. Um, if I hit tab twice, I get down here and I'm going to enter um, VF equals 0 0.95. We'll just make it that. That's because of the PVC coating on the wire. Yeah, but you know, this is a variable. We can change it later. Hit and tab yeah. again. And VF is velocity factor, right? Right. I just didn't want to spell all it out. I've actually found that to be accurate. It's about 0.95 with the it, it standard depend, PVC depend, wire. <laughs> it depends on the conductor. Depends on the conduct, conductor size. Conduct, depends on the insulation type, Teflon, nylon. Um, anyway, and now we're going to enter something called um, Wire wave length. Take them home. Take them home. Oops. Uh, okay, wire wavelength equals wave length divide or times VF. 
and this will be the wave length in our wire. Now we can go back later and we change this velocity factor and, um, and that'll affect the wire wavelength. And you'll see soon why we're doing this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and save this. So I'm hitting control S on my keyboard, but you can click on the little disc. Go back to geometry. Wavelength times velocity factor or wire wavelength equals wavelength times velocity factor. Yeah, that's the wavelength in the wire. And uh, anyway, in our geometry now, we're gonna go times VF. for our x1 and our x2. And I'm gonna save that. And I'm gonna calculate. And I'm gonna do a frequency sweep. Everything else can stay. And now our wire is a lot shorter. Um, so we're gonna do, okay, so now you've seen what that does. Now we're gonna do something more interesting. This minus five here, we're gonna do wire wave length. <laughs> I should have made this into a shorter variable, but length, wire wavelength divided by two. Ooh, that's why we save our work. So I'm going to open. Let's Okay, I'm gonna go back into the editor. Okay, so minus wire wave length divided by two. And this will be wire length divided by two. So one of these is negative and one of them is positive. I think I can show that here. That one's positive, this one's neg negative. Um, that should actually be divided by four. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm gonna save that. And um, our wire wavelength is wavelength times our velocity factor. So if we change our velocity factor here, it's gonna update the geometry. And um, if I, so I've saved it. If I run it, frequency sweep, Generate. Now we can easily, we can seek this point. Um, and one way to do that. I got a segment check. What did I do? Okay, let's. That means one of your. Gary, are we running auto segment? No. No, we're defining the number of segments. So um, check, check to make sure this makes sense here, Robert. Because that's the part we were just working on. A minus whatever length divided by four. Oh, 
minus layer wave L E I G T H divided by four. Okay. Okay, zero, ten. Everything else is the same. Okay. Okay. That all seems the same. Yeah, look at it in your geometry window. Does it look right there? The, uh, it's, oh, the, the antenna is longer than yours. Appears well, long. the scale can be off. I can okay. zoom in and out and it'll, see if I do that, looks like the wire is shorter, but it's not. So you can go over here, go to validate and choose run geometry check. No geometry warnings. Okay. Okay. So just save that, run it again. Frequency sweep, right? Okay. Yeah. Generate. And should look something like this. this is, I'm not seeing that window with a red line. It says errors or warnings found run segment check. You want, you want to share your screen? Uh, okay. Oops. Go ahead and share it, Robert. Um, okay, share. What do I do here? There's a green button called share screen. Okay, um, then I will share, what am I gonna share here? Um, Just share your whole screen. Okay, yeah. So why are my wavelength? So bring up your uh, editor, close that window and bring up your editor. Okay. That all looks good. Let's look at symbols as well. Let's look at symbols, yeah. Now, it should be wavelength times VF. Is Wait, that correct? Uh, Why are wavelength right. equals? Wavelength times VF? Why are okay. wavelength? Oh, so on where it says wavelength equals, I see 299, et cetera, frequency. Should there be a slash in there? Ah, okay, yep. There, there we go. go. Okay. All right, save the work. Run thing, generate. And, well, and, it, and, and the wire wavelength should be the wavelength divide or times the velocity. Factor, yeah, it is. It I, okay. Yeah, we just can't really see it. So this looks okay, good. good. Okay. So, so you can uh, stop sharing and I'll. Okay, where do I stop? Gary, you should just be able to take it back over. There we okay. go. Okay. Oops, now I got to get my VMR back. Okay. Okay, Thank you. so it should look something like this. And you see, we're still a little off from 14.1. I'm going to introduce you to another tool called the Optimizer. And we can go up to the Calculate menu in the main window. Go to the main window, choose Calculate Start Optimizer. You can also hit F12. Oh, it says, please close edit window first. So we're going to close that. Calculate Start Optimizer. And um, we're going to optimize a variable called VF. And we're going to make This is a little advanced, not too advanced, but if you if you enter SWR80 up here and XN20, that's the way I like to do it. What that does is it, it tries to get rid of any imaginary, it, it, it tries to get rid of um, feedback on your feed line. Uh, it tries to get rid of reflections on your feed line. That's what oh. it does. So, and what you're doing by doing that is notice it says weighting factors. 
in percentage. It's basically looking at running the optimization. Like if you run 100% SWR, it'll optimize SWR. It'll, it'll take whatever variable you select and mess with those to get the lowest possible SWR. Yeah, you'll see real soon what this does. And, and you can split it. You could make it 20, 20, 20, 20, and 20%. 20 and it gets a little complicated, but it'll try to do it. Yeah. So, so I'm, gonna I'm gonna click start. And it's trying some different numbers for velocity factor. And it says, I got pretty close after 24 tries. It says, see here, five dash. So um, here it says SWR going down. Looks like you got lowest on this 4 4. Anyway, we're going to click update NEC file. And that actually modifies the file we've been editing. And um, now we close this. We open our editor window, edit input file. We go back to symbols, and you see VF has been updated. And so now we're gonna go ahead and look at our sweep now. And now our lowest SWR point, well, it, it's also trying to reduce the reflection coefficient by 20%. That's 20% weight and 80% of the weight is the uh, SWR. So um, basically it says, well, this is this antenna is ready to build. Um, I want to explain the, uh, something about this velocity factor. Um, when we made our wire out of copper, it made the wire less conductive than it would have been. When we put insulation on the wire, it made the wire less conductive. Now, how does that happen? Well, it's because RF flows on the outside of the wire. It actually doesn't flow through the wire at all, hardly. There are electrons, there's a skin of electrons along the wire, and that's uh, the wave travels through those electrons on the outside of the wire. That's one of the reasons that this program got, bases everything on surfaces, because uh, this is not, we're not calculating direct current here. We're calculating RF. RF Question. flows. Yeah, go ahead. So if you're using uh, copper clad steel wire, you still select copper? You yep. still, yes. Now, it would be nice if they allowed you to choose copper clad steel. Well, uh -huh. although essentially it's going to behave just like copper, because most, right. because virtually all of the, and that's why co and that's why copper weld is such a great thing, because it has the strength of steel but the conductivity of copper. Thank you. Right. So, um, so when we when we made these two changes, the wire became less conductive. Well, one of the things I learned that was really interesting was if I use a thick vinyl um, insulation, it's not affected by rain as much as if I had used like THHN nylon, or uh, even if you use Teflon. Teflon, um, you know, you can buy coax with Teflon and so on. I don't think many people use Teflon insulation in their wire. Nylon is a better insulator. THHN is a better insulator overall, but because it's thin, instead of being one millimeter thick, it would probably be 0.04 or something, 00. O4. Um, it's more when when it gets wet, it's more affected by the water. So I, I've actually been very happy with this thick PVC insulation. That's just something to keep in mind down the road. I use you, a type it, UL. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, question. Uh, so is there a water model model in this? Oh, that'd be nice, insulator? wouldn't it? No. I don't know. There might be one of these that would be close. It's so pretty I will, variable. I, yeah. If you um, 
Okay, so we've been working inside here and I'm gonna show you what we're actually doing now when we choose this. Well, I'm down gonna, to dielectric constants and this this is what the constants you might find that one of them, like glass, is actually pretty close to water. Water's like one point three one point three three. This is what the file so, looks like as a text file. And um, if you look here, this is copper right here, 58 million. That's conductivity in copper. And this, 4.5 is conductivity in PVC. The conductivity in um, nylon is 2.4. The conductivity in Teflon is 2.1. In general, Teflon and nylon are better because they stop they're, they're better insulators. They, they actually slow the, uh, they slow down the, they don't absorb as much energy. That's probably the best way to put it. Even though they stop DC better, they, they don't slow the RF down as much. But as I said, when it rains, the wire gets a lot, a lot longer using Teflon or nylon than it does using uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm pointing this out because you can go into this file and see what those, what those dielectric constants actually are. Where'd you pull that file up? This is the same file opened in a text editor. Oh, okay. Thanks. If you go back to the main window, to settings, notepad edit, and then you choose edit the file, it'll look like this. This is the same file. This is what this information gets massaged by Fornec2 and then it's sent to NEC2, which is the old Fortran program. That's why you get that black DOS window popping up because it's passing a text file to Fornet to uh, NEC2 and then it sends the file back when it's done. So you can look at this file and see what's really going on. Now you see these uh, two letter abbreviations over here. This first one is comment. Second one is comment end. The third one is symbol, SY. That means we're defining, defining a variable. NEC doesn't know anything about variables. Fornac2 knows about variables and it'll plug these values in when it runs across them down here. Um, so here in my geometry, G, GW means geometry wire, it says wire tag is one, 101 segments. Then it looks up here to see what wire wavelength is. And, and to resolve that, it has to look at velocity factor. It divides it by four, makes it negative. And all this stuff gets sent to NEC2 as just numbers. Um, so that's, if I go back to settings and choose NEC editor new, go to edit input file, then I get my old window back. So be, we're gonna, in the, in the next, we're gonna take a little break, but when we get back, I'm gonna send you a, uh, a dipole file that has a whole bunch more variables in it. And um, we're gonna explore that and then we're going to add a coax shield simulation because it's going to have a transmission line for the coax. We're going to add coax shield and we're going to move that coax shield around and see how it imbalances the dipole. We're going to add a reflector, turning this into a Yagi, and we're going to add a director, turning it into a better Yagi. So let's, uh, it's 15. Question. Yeah, go ahead. Are you also going to cover bent segments, like uh, if you want to design a Moxon? Yeah, I can show you how to model that. We, if we have time, we'll we'll go ahead and create a Moxon. Wonderful. Um, yep. Just two wires <clears throat> connect, two wires with a common connection at one point. In fact, you know, in space. I said, well, we're going to make a Yagi, but we can make a Moxon instead. Um, now let's start with a Yagi. We got yeah. Do the do do what you were going to do. That's fine. okay. <laughs> yeah, you'll see. I, um. 
I, I will show you how to connect wires. In fact, the, the model I'm sending, I will be sending you has three wires in it instead of just one. And by the way, this one, if you change this segment number here from 51 to 26, and you save it and you calculate. Um, what you get is an off-center fed dipole. Right, because you didn't change your feed point. The right. feed point section feed point is moved. Still, yeah. Right. Well, it moved. It, it's still the, the same segment, but you have fewer segments. So, so you could you could uh, optimize. Can you yeah. optimize multiple frequencies? I'm sure. sure. Yeah, sure. you can even move that point around. You can make that into a variable yeah. and move that around. See where it works best. It'll work right. best in the middle. I'll tell you right. right now. But like you can say you can say feed segment equals, and then that can be one of the things that you put into your optimizer as a variable and have it move it. Yeah. So. Um, if you look at the SWR, the SWR went up, so that you need a tuner. <laughs> right. But what's, but what's but, cool about it is let's say that you have a non-resonant antenna and you say, where's my right. optimal point to feed it. Right. So you can you play can, around that and you can make it a thousand segments Yeah. and, and then it can get a lot finer grain and all that. Um, so we're going to get back together at 3.30. Is that enough time for everybody? Yep. Good for me. Eight minutes. Thank you. All right. See you then.
Hey, Gary, the, just so you know, the Ducks are up 45-23. 45-23? In case you care, the Ducks are winning 45-23. Well. Uh, In the fourth quarter. The Ducks are winning. Yeah, I'm back. 45-23 against UCLA. <laughs> but it's far from over. <laughs> Gary, if you wouldn't mind... I missed the optimization setup. I had to excuse myself for a moment. Sure. Would you, would you mind showing me that again? I apologize. Yeah. Fine. So I'm gonna just putting us back the way it was. Mm -hmm. um, I have to close this window after saving the pile. Then I go to calculate, start optimizer in the main window. And I have it set up to opera, optimize velocity factor. And my weighting factors are 80% SWR and 20% uh, impedance in. Um, <clears throat> the goal there is, is to match 50 ohms impedance. Mm -hmm coming into the coax or into the and also drive the swr as low as possible this if you just set this rest wr 100 and nothing on the impedance it would, it would still get there it would get pretty close it, usually when your when your wire models start getting more complicated you start getting some feedback going on in places you didn't expect it and matching the impedance is pretty important. You know, uh, whether you have a one point one one to one or a one point five to one, it's not nearly as important as having fifty ohms coming into your into your feed point. Right. Um, mismatch there is where you lose energy. So then you just click start. And it runs for a little while, tries different things. In this case, it ended up right back where it was. Where, where's the start button? I'm sorry. It's, it's right here where it, Oh, there it is. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's running. Yeah. And um, once when you get done, once it's done all this. You, you can resume if you want to go farther. Anyway, sometimes SWR gets stuck. That's one of the reasons I do this impedance match thing too, because you know some antennas are so simple. Anyway, when you're done, click this. If you want to overwrite the value that's in your... Um, change the name. Yeah, so if you wanted to update BF, in your input file, you click update NEC file and it, it lets you um, overwrite what's in there. Yeah. And then you close that, open your... Uh... So what that did is it, it optimized this variable. When we started out, it was 0.95. So, that's kind of interesting because um, if you figure out in what what is really telling you is that here on Earth, using copper and, and PVC insulation, this is your velocity factor in that wire. It's 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 almost like it's calculating the velocity factor for you when you optimize it. Hey, Gary. Yeah. One thing that I noticed when we when we did that optimization last time, the, the, the variable that we optimized on was velocity factor. So right. is that actually saying we know this antenna is supposed to work? Let's figure out what the real velocity factor is, because essentially we were changing the velocity factor to make the antenna work better. Right. What it's doing is it is shortening and lengthening the antenna because our wire wavelength depends on the velocity factor. Oh, true that, okay. So it, it's telling us how long those wires should be.
based on the insulation. See, if, remember, if we get rid of these two guys, like, let's just do that. Yeah, see, I, I understand. Now, you, you, we, we could we also get, just, but, get, but go ahead, sorry. Like, if we just do uninsulated wire, um, um, let's see. If we delete this line. See, and I, I just wanted to point out that that, you know, basically that what we're really doing is optimizing the antenna based on what we think the velocity factor should be in order to make it longer or shorter. Now that doesn't actually change the velocity factor, but what it is doing is it's changing the effective length of the antenna because the velocity factor is multiplied by the by the real wavelength or by, right. by the by the free space wavelength. Right. So what I've done is I got rid of the PVC insulation. If I run this again, now it says that insulation was really slowing things down. It says our velocity factor should actually be 0.977 instead of 0.93, whatever. If I update this and if I run this now, our wire With, without the insulation, it still matches our 14.1, but it, we had to make it longer to do that because before the insulation was making the wire longer. So now the wire, instead of being 0.93, whatever, if I go in here and upload it or reload it, our velocity factor is now 0.9768 instead of, um, instead of 0.93 something. So that's, I think velocity factor is appropriate there. I think that's the right thing to, to think, the right way to think of that. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, send you, I'm gonna send you a link in the chat window. Um, so let me, <laughs> like, like personally, I personally I don't like messing with velocity factor, but that's just me. What I what I have is like just a length, and then if I come up with a number, and I know that my velocity factor is x, then the number that I come up with for my antenna length, I just multiply it by or divide it or multiply it by the velocity factor. Yeah. So, so. yeah, in the in the next model, you'll see why this why this is useful to do it this way. Um, you know, if I put that insulation back, it would shorten the wire again. Um, in order to get a good match. So I'm gonna go into chat and I'm gonna paste in a link and send it, let's see. Okay, there is a link in the chat now if anybody has trouble getting to chat, um, let me know. And if you click there, it'll open up a window in your browser with a couple files in it. One of them is a hex beam model, and one of them is a dipole model. And you can go ahead and save both of those to your computer. The dipole model we're going to use next. So save that where you have been, um, put that where your other file is and we're gonna open it up. And if you look at that file, you'll see it has a lot of variables in it. For instance, there's a height variable called H. That's in all the, most of the Z terms here. There's a R 
two, which is half of the radiator length, and then F2, which is half of the feeder length. There's RS, which is the radiator segments, the number of segments in the radiators. Um, there's, and um, so we got our frequency, we got our wavelength in space, we got our velocity factor, we've got our velocity, our wi wire wavelength. Gary, how do I download those files? So you, um, you go to the chat. No, I got the, I've got the directory. They're just not yeah. downloading. Do you see the, you see the dipole and the hex beam? Yep. Okay. Right click on it. Okay. And choose save link as. Save image save, as. Save, I'm on a Mac. Right. Save as or save link as or save file as. Say, copy image link. No. Open image. It doesn't recognize what the file is, I think. Well, it doesn't know what an NEC file is, does it? No. So that's the thing about Max, isn't it? They have Mac has to know what everything is. Okay. Uh, so, so I can do that. All right. I guess I can do it. I can try doing that directly in Windows. Uh, okay. That's the Edge browser. That's the Windows thingy. I'm assuming. Right. So on my window, it looks like this. And I right click on it to save link as. See, uh, this question mark says that, you know, the web no, Windows, just a sec. Windows is being really annoying. Um, okay. There's the link. There we go. Okay. And so, okay, so in Windows, save link as. Yeah, you right click on it, choose save link as. And if you were running Firefox on the Mac, probably you'd see something similar. Okay, so I'm going to save it. To the same place where you saved your class.nec file. I, know, I don't know where that is. Um, I'm going to just put it on the desktop, I guess. If you try to do an open, on an, if you go try to do an open from the edit window, it'll tell you where it saved it. Just use that directory. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, if you go to the main window, choose file open. Okay, and then try opening it. Desktop. Okay, that means I have to find. Is, is that why Mac users always put everything on their desktop? Um, I don't know. I don't. Good. I do stuff I'm working on. Right. And then it gets filed away. Okay, so save. Okay, Gary, so which 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 antenna are we gonna open? The hex uh, beam or the dipole? Dipole. Dipole. The hex beam model is there for people to explore themselves. Um, it's also useful as a hex beam model. <laughs> Okay. Darwin. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, I'll take you through these symbols. The first line is frequency. That's pretty obvious. Line two, L equals speed of light divided by the frequency. I think everybody probably knows that. 
Um, line three is velocity factor equals 0.9215. That was hand optimized, but you know, we can that can be modified if we change our insulation or whatever. Um, and then fourth line is velocity length, wavelength of wire at the velocity factor. And then our wire radius, our wire coat radius, which is a wire radius plus a millimeter. You don't do just the millimeter or else it'll end up inside the wire. <laughs> Insulation type, I've spelled out a few numbers here you can plug in. A height above ground is, is the wavelength in space divided by two. So um, the height above ground doesn't have anything to do with velocity factor in the, in, the, in the wire. So we're using L instead of VL. Um, Radiator wire segments each side, that affects accuracy a um, little bit. Feeder length each side. This model has three wires. It has, um, well, we'll get there in a sec. Anyway, this is the length of the feeder wire inside the model. In other words, this is how far apart the wires are that you're connecting to the dipole. There's no wire there. And then the radiator length each side is our wire wavelength um, times a quarter. And so those variables get plugged into the geometry thing here. The first wire is the left wire. And it's minus radiator length divided by two and it stops at the feeder length divided by two. Those are all at, at height above ground. The radius is the wire radius. The middle, the second wire is the feeder wire. It's the feed wire, yeah, the feeder, okay. And it's at minus F2, 2F2. Two and then the right wire goes from the right end of the feeder to the end of the antenna. Then there's a fourth wire here. And what that is, it goes from minus F2 to F2 also, but it's, it's one meter above ground. Instead of being at height, it's, it's closer to the ground. We have... Um, our voltage source, it says use wire number four. And we have our loads, our conductor is copper, our wire coat, the conductivity is I for insulation. And that was, that's a symbol over here. Symbol is I 4.5 and then C, is our wire radi is our insulation radius. That's defined as a symbol also. Wire plus one millimeter. Um, then we have a trans line. Oh, this is a new thing. It goes from wire two, which is the middle of the dipole, to wire four, which is where we're feeding the, vo the voltage in. And um, we want to feed it at 50 ohms. And the length, len here, the length, trans lines in NEC2 are, or in Fornac2, are, um, you, even though we're connecting point 0.4 to point 0.2, we can actually define the length here as anything we want it to be. I'm defining it as a half wavelength here. Everybody knows that coax, it's half wavelength long, shows the same thing at one end as it does at the other. Um, these, this trans line is open on both ends, which just means that it's not shorted. 
Um, if you can also make it a short if you want. Now that's kind of interesting. If we look at that model as text, we got our transline here, TL. The short, the opens mean that there's no conductivity or it's actually called, it's not permittivity, maybe it is permittivity. Anyway, if I make that a short instead, let's watch what happens. If I say, well, this end shorted, I save it. And I look at it in my text editor. Now it says it's one E plus nine, nine. So this is a shorted, um, that's conductivity um, or permittivity or whatever. I can't remember. That's what conductivity. Yeah. So I'm gonna change this to open and save it again. And now when we look at it, it's back to zero for our trans line. So that's why it's sometimes useful to go back and forth between the text editor and this. So you can see what numbers it's plugging in there. Okay. Um, our frequency and ground is the same. Any questions? Okay, this is what we've got. And I'm going to zoom in on this. If you want to move the thing around in the window, you use the right button on your mouse <laughs> to zoom in. You hit page up. That's kind of weird. So here's where it, this is one wire, this is another wire, and this is another wire. And if I go over here to show wire numbers, it says this is wire number two. And if I zoom out, this is wire one and that's wire three. Down at the bottom, it's wire number four. Let's take a look at what that looks like. There's wire four. Notice wire four is being fed with the source. Now this transmission line thing, it's a perfect transmission line. It does not have any it doesn't pick up any uh, stray RF on its shielding. There is no shielding. <laughs> it's perfect. Well, that's not really realistic, is it? If we want to see what what uh, having a piece of coax shield, th this would be like open wire line. It's even better than that, really. But because even open wire line, if you drag this off to the side, it'll affect the balance on this dipole. Um, I'm, we're going to go ahead and calculate. We'll see what what the frequency sweep looks like. Uh, these frequency, these numbers are all the same for this model. <clears throat> so, so Gary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what you've drawn is basically a a dipole where you're doing kind of like a, a feed at a shorted point, sort of like a... Uh, no, what? It, it's not short, it's open. Um, well, it's kind of, uh, can you zoom in on the picture? Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of confusing that way because... Okay, it's open once, now. All right, all right. Once, once, yeah, once you run it, it opens up. And the reason is that that wire disappears. That okay. wire is no longer in the model. And when we were doing the the dipole model earlier, the simple one, wherever we put that feed point, that segment disappeared. It, it's no longer in the model. It's only used for locating, locating the, uh, I'll show you the other end here. So um, this, that, that, that is shown there because it's the source. That's why it's showing that wire. But okay, I just ran mine and I got a segment check error. 
So, okay. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on. But first, um, so this is something you can do, Scott. Go to validate and do run segment checks. Tell me what it says. Error wire one, wire two, wire three, wire four. I can just share my screen too. Yeah, I'll go ahead. <sighs> oh, how do I download the file? Late checking back in. Let me do that first. Um, go, if, I, I think I already handled that one. Okay, Marty. Oh, okay. Marty, you're all set now? Yeah, I got Okay. Marty, did you get it? Yes, got the file. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. I got the segment error first time I ran it. I closed it and ran it again, and I didn't get the segment error. Okay, let me try that. Okay. I, yeah, this, I'm looking at this, and it looks like you're, um, Yeah. Nope, still not happy. It and looks notice like, the feed yeah, that, point, it didn't, it didn't split it on mine. It doesn't look right. And this doesn't look right. So let's look at your geometry. Or you can, <laughs> maybe you could open that file again. Oh, okay. Actually, I shared the wrong thing. Stop share. I want to share the whole screen. And it's actually very instructive to go through this process because you're right. going to have issues that come up. <laughs> yep, it'll happen. You are. Okay, so you want me to look at the file? Okay. File looks good there. Let's look that at the all source. Looks good. Mm, looks good. <laughs> See, and actually what I would normally do is I would have two Y, I would actually make two separate wires there. And, uh, and but see, you've got one and three. That's, that's really weird. Because those are the legs, right? No, well, no, those are the, that's the dipole. Those right. are the dipole wires. Right. right, those are the legs of the dipole. If you want to call them legs, yeah. They are the legs to me. You know, they're sticking right. out sideways. Yeah, I think of them as arms. Uh, okay, arms. <laughs> um, R2, F2, F2, R2. All right, I'll, I'll figure it out. Keep going. Uh, let's go. Hmm. Okay. I'll well, figure let, it out. Let's go back. I think I might have noticed something. You want me to open mine again, or you want to? Yeah, open I want to see you. I want to see yours again. I think maybe in wire four there was a problem. Let's see. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so let's look at your geometry window again. Okay. Didn't the error say something about the number of segments? Yeah, it did. Well, no. Well, it's it, no, it said it's that there were like, there were certain segments. segments that it didn't like. So if I run it again, save, run, and run a frequency sweep. See, and errors are warning, run segment check. That would be in the validate menu on F3. Let's run geometry check too. Okay. Oh, now it's happy. <laughs> ah. Let's let's try it. Let's run it again. Oh, you have auto segmentation turned on. Uh, I bet I do. I normally turn that off. That's the problem. What's happening is it's it's auto segmenting things it shouldn't. Yep, probably so. Yep, there's auto segmentation. Okay, while we're on that subject, I'll just explain what that is. On certain models, it's hard to, rather than you figuring out how, how long your segments should be, how many segments should be in a wire, you can let the program do that. I tend to manage that myself. 
Um, there we go. Uh, yeah. Did now, it. You, now, now we're good. good. Okay. Now, where is the here. auto auto segment thing to stay away from? It's here. <laughs> it's this one. It it's a good thing if you're if you're Go ahead doing and a lot Gary, of Gary, you're not sharing your screen. Go ahead and take it again. Okay. I'm done. So if you go into settings, there's a item called auto segmentation. You can experiment with that. I tend to manage that myself. Um, okay, I see that. Yeah, mine worked the second time, not the first time. Right. So besides um, showing wire numbers, we can also show tag and show segments. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> so I'm going to zoom out and show you what. And actually, it when I did it that time, it split my uh, it split my wire at the feed point. So there you go. So if um, you'll notice that these these spacings here are pretty similar. NEC likes similar spacings. It um, it's one of the reasons I manage it myself. But um, so it's showing all the segments on that wire here. And I defined it as 100, but I can make it 500 if I wanted or whatever. In my case, I knew how far apart I wanted these two parts of the trans line to be. So I defined the length of segment two, and then I picked a, a number of segments for the radiating wires that is similar so that these lengths are all similar. That's the other thing you'll run into in the, uh, actually that error message you were seeing, Scott, was that there was too rapid a change. It was complaining that the the, um, the number of or the, the length of this segment was too different from from this. That was actually what it was complaining about. Okay, so everybody recognizes that this blue wire, these blue wires are um, the transmission line. Uh, so that's kind of a cool thing. Um, you can run seg transmission lines all over the place and they don't lose any power and so on, which makes them, which is cool. But so um, so here's our uh, SWR and our impedance, or uh, I mean, our reflection coefficient. Here's our pattern. I'm gonna run this now instead of as a sweep, I'm gonna do a far field pattern and we'll look at it in 3D. And we'll, we can also now go here and show both horizontal and vertical. Looks pretty similar to what we saw before. We're going to go 3D viewer. And um, we can spin this around. And I'm going to change show structure to show currents. And you can see down, down here at the bottom, you can see the source. Um, that's the way that any, that Fornac 2 shows loads and sources and all that. And um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff I could show you here. It's not terribly important at this point, but you, you, you've probably noticed by now that there are so many menus and options, for instance, in this optimizer window. Instead of optimize, you can choose evolve. You can choose sweep, which, which will graph changes. It'll show you, it'll graph all the changes it makes so you can see um, what what's happening to the impedance curves and all that kind of stuff as it's making the changes. Um, I'm not sure what the convolution test or something, but uh, Gary Rondeau is telling me he likes this evolve because it lets you kind of optimize and then change something and optimize it some more and evolve something. I'm not gonna get into that right now. Okay, does everybody's antenna look kind of like this? <laughs> I 
All right. I can't I I can't see the horizontal and vertical patterns. It says something about a window is still hanging around somewhere. It might be the editor window. Let's see. So Yeah, there's so much stuff. Um, I'll show you something else here in this window. Gary, how do you get that red, the red line again? In the... I chose in, where it said structure. I changed it to currents. Oh, oh I see. Okay. okay. And that's, that's showing where the current is the highest, which implies where the voltage is the lowest. Uh, voltage to current ratio is 50 to 1. Here in the middle, it's 50 ohms. But out here at the end, it's three or four, two or three or four thousand ohms. So, so which I have height structure, structure, wire, LD5. Change it to currents. I don't see currents in the drop down menu. Um, Keep going down, Robert. It's. Ah, with, hmm. I can't, I can't get it. It doesn't, it's not going down. No. Nope. You want, you you want got, to share, you, share you your got screen? Structure, wire, LD5, error, segments, and then currents. Under. I have error warnings and then wires. I'm not sure what, that means okay. I think you haven't run it yet. Oh, no, I have. You have to. You have to do the far field. You have right. to run, do the far field pattern. Okay, generate. And generate. Okay. Okay. Ah, there we go. Okay. So, in structure or in sec. What am I doing? Currents. Currents, and then the other thing we're going to do here is where it says hide pattern. We're going to change that to multicolor. Mm. Ooh, cool. needs to go home. And that what? is our and a left. This is our traditional dipole at a half wave, mm -hmm. half wavelength dipole at a half wave height. Pattern is, um, if we look down this window, you'll see that most of the energy. If you look from the origin, you'll see that most of the energy is going out near 60 degrees. And uh, if I turn off, show both horizontal and vertical, then it'll show me this line. And um, it shows the gain that, you know, so here I got 7.29 dB at 60 degrees. Well, that doesn't do me a lot of good. If it, uh, it can help if you're trying to get people in the United States. But, and when um, you say 60 degrees, it's it's 30 degrees from the from the horizontal. In this case, it's 60 degrees from the vertical. Right. I'm just showing that here. Yeah. And um, but if you're trying to do dx, then you want to be down near 85 from the vertical, and then our our gain is about minus three, which which is still not terrible. It's not bad. So. Um, question. Yeah. If, uh, you know, like it's a tree branch, you know, it's strung through trees and you've got a branch that's touching it somewhere that's, you know, wet or something, what happens? How, how thick is your insulation? I, I'm just, just hypothetically here. What? Oh, I'm, I hy see. I'm hypothetically wondering what your insulation is. Um, I don't know. Whatever I got from ham radio outlet. <laughs> Is it bare wire or is it? Oh, no, it's insulated. It would be, um, uh, what's that? The, the stealth or something like, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's probably pretty thin insulation. Yeah. Um, it depends on the frequency too. If it's, if it's a lower frequency, if it's 40 meters or lower than, um, you know, seven megahertz or lower, it's not going to have a lot of impact. But at the, as you go above that, It'll have more, for instance, if you try to transmit through a wet tree on two meters, it's not going to work very well. If the tree's dry, probably you'll get through pretty well. But if it's wet, 
Okay. Um, so it really, it's really frequency dependent. Couldn't you model that here? Put in a, a wire made out of wood? <laughs> yeah, you Maybe can. That's what it's for, for tree modeling. The yeah, wood. that's probably true. Yeah, you could model some stumps or, uh, yeah. Um, so if everybody's good, we're going to go ahead and throw a, a reflector in here and see what happens. Okay. Okay. So we're going to pull up our editor and we're going to stick another wire in here. And uh, this will be five. And we can make it one segment. Well, I'm going to make it more. I'm going to make it. Huh, shift tab goes forward. OK, so I'm going to make it 200 seconds just for fun. I'm, I'm trying to roughly match the uh, what's there. I've got 100 segments on each end plus a segment in the middle. So I'm going to make it 201. And uh, this, our X1 will be minus, well, I can just do minus R2. So that's the radiator length times 1.05. We'll just add 5%. And, um, Zero is good. Oh, actually, okay. So this is where we define the spacing between these guys. And um, I don't know a lot about this, but we're going to make it um, minus R2 divided by 2. And uh, Z is going to be the same height. So H, X2 will be R2 times 1.05. Y2 will be minus, whoops. Yeah, minus R2 again, divided by two. We're making it a quarter wave apart. That might be a really bad idea, we'll see. And uh, Z2 will be H, and the wire radius will be the same. And we'll call this the reflector. And we'll save that. Now, this, this spacing distance here, that's, that's ripe for a single variable which we could then run through the optimizer and the optimizer could figure out how far apart the reflector should be. So we're probably gonna go back there, but for now we're just gonna plug this in and see what happens. You can also do the same with that 1.05. Yeah, I know that generally it's gonna be 5% more, but so here's our antenna now. And we've got our reflector and it's a little bit longer than the And if we added a director, it would be out in front here and it'd be shorter. So I've saved it. Okay, cool. And now I'm going to calculate and we'll do frequency sweep again. Whenever you have parallel wires in NEC, Ideally, they'll, they'll match point for point with the other parallel wire. The segments should be, oh, look, we have some gain. And our looks like our frequency is a little bit off. Um, so we could optimize that. Let's go ahead and do the op, let's go ahead and optimize the frequency. I'm starting, oh, close edit window first, okay. We're going to start the optimizer and we're going to do the velocity factor again. And we're going to start it. And 
we'll just go ahead and update the NEC file. And now we're going to close that and do our frequency sweep. What did, what did you optimize for? I'm a little behind here. I optimized for velocity factor. Okay. By the way, did you, they, if, did you still use the 80, 20, 80% 80 yes, SWR, 20% yes. X in? Yes, I did. And um, so this looks pretty good. And um, there is some, you can see this is a little bit off from 14.1. That's because I didn't just optimize for SWR. I also optimized for 50 ohms at the uh, input. That's what you see when you do that. Now, this this looks pretty good over here. If, we, if you select the pattern window and hit the right arrow key, it'll start stepping through the frequencies. At 14.1, you're seeing what, what our design frequency is. If you go left, it goes down to 14. If you go right, it goes up to higher parts of the band. So you can actually see what the front to back ratio is at 14.35. You see it's changed. At the low end of the band, we've got a lot more front to back ratio. So you can actually step yeah. step through these frequencies. Yeah, go ahead. Question. Um, my pattern uh, plot did not update. Everything else did, but not the pattern plot, F4. So you I see you close the window and open it again. See if that. Nope. Okay. You want to share your screen? Uh, I can't because I've got it running on two different computers now. Okay. Um, well, let me see. Maybe I can. There we go. <clears throat> okay. You see this? Did not update. Okay. And I close it. I run F4 again. Oh, now it's not coming up. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, go ahead and go up to calculate. Or um, <clears throat> you can hit NEC output data. That's, that's the normal window. Frequency sweep. Okay, everything looks good. So antennas really are as simple as this. Um, <laughs> all we did was add a reflector at a quarter wave yeah, still came up wrong. Wow. So let me see what's going on here. The frequency is right, 14. Um, go ahead and hit right arrow. Go ahead and select that window and hit right arrow and see what happens. This one? Yeah, just select that with, with your left mouse button. No, don't hit that. Click on the where it says pattern F4. Just click over yeah, there. Just, just, the just give it focus. No, you have to do do the left mouse button. Yeah, just give it focus. Okay, and that's now, all. Now hit the right arrow. Not no. the right mouse button. The not right the arrow. Right, oh, no. oh, 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 oh. The right sorry, arrow. Yeah. On sorry, your, sorry, sorry. Yep. Okay. Okay. Hit it again. No. No. Nothing's Don't happening. Click. So you're hitting the, the right. right. You're hitting yeah, the, the right, right arrow. On your on your keyboard. On the keyboard. Yes. And it's not See the frequency anywhere. moving. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's working. So. Huh. Um, okay. I don't know. But but it doesn't look like mine, does it? No. Your, that's the uh, only thing that. Does. Oh, there. Oh no, that's my screen. Your SWR yeah. looks okay. Yeah, this came up fine. This came up fine. Hmm. Weird. The reflector isn't showing, right? 
Yeah, it's there. Go ahead and show me what's in. But far it should be asymmetric in the in the pattern window. Yeah, click on the far field button. Yeah, this was show. the dipole. Right. Far click field. on far field menu. Uh, hmm. Let me. See. Is this the Yagi that all, or the dipole? That all looks fine. This is the, the Yagi, it, the two element. Right. It's still called dipole, but it's a Yagi now. Two element what, dipole. <laughs> what does it look like in the 3D window? How do I get there? Uh, if F9. Just, F9. F9. Hello, F9. It's not working. Or under... Um, hmm. Under window, okay. yeah, you can just just there spin it, it around up there, yeah. Okay, and now that all looks good. Go ahead and change structure to um, current. Currents. Yeah, that looks right. Now change now where it says magnitude. Where it says magnitude, change that to both. Down below currents, where it says magnitude, change it to both. Okay, now spin it around so we can see it. So this is where you start seeing phasing. <clears throat> Notice that these two uh, currents are 90 degrees from each other. Well, remember the spacing is a quarter wave. That's what you see with a quarter wave spacing. If we, um, that's, that's normal for 90 degree spacing, but we, we would prefer that well, one. The currents in phase far field, right? Right. It would be better if these two uh, conductors were half wave apart, wouldn't it? Yeah. Or so, point 0.1 or so. Right. So go ahead and close that viewer. I'm not sure what's going on with your pattern okay. window. I see it. I can duplicate what um, Ken sees. It's that phi angle. You see in the bottom left corner, it says phi equals zero. Yeah. You go Maybe. back to generate. And yeah. um, I, if I enter in phi equals zero on that, yeah, on that calculate, generate, yeah, see the phi equals zero, put in 90 there. Now click generate. And now click, click generate. Oh, so this is how you look at it from a different side. Okay, yeah, I never, I, I wasn't sure what that did. Now I know. <laughs> I don't know what it does either, but I just I just saw that his said phi equals zero in the bottom corner. So I, I went back and typed that in. Look at that. Yeah. So that's it. So that's that shows that tells the program which side is the front. Ah. Uh, uh. Oh, okay. It had a had a bilateral. We were looking at it from the other end. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well go ahead Thank and you. go ahead and share. Right. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Learn something new today. That's kind of the idea. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Okay, so let's uh, change the spacing. Let's change it to a half wave and see what. So I'm going to go to edit input file where this says y1 equals r2 divided by 2. We'll make it r2. And save. And calculate. Did you make one one? <clears throat> so are we saying that phi angle is just you're looking down the barrel of the antenna as opposed to looking at the side? Yeah, that's what you know you can model your antenna in any direction. So it, being able to enter that angle allows you to see it from whatever angle you want. So you see my phi right now is 89. I don't know why. But, but apparently, okay, so anyway, so this is a half wave apart now. I'm gonna bring up my, I'm gonna calculate, first I'll look at the SWR. It looks kind of normal for a dipole. I'm gonna look at the 3D viewer. Actually, that's not really that much fun right now until I calculate the far field. So I'm going back to far field clicking generate, and then we can see, you have to go to the far field if you want to see the multicolored pattern. 
Okay, so now I can go to window 3D viewer. I can go currents and I can say, say show me magnitude and phase. Hmm, it's been a while. So this is what, this is what using Cornet 2 is all about. What, what the hell happened? Anyway, now we're gonna look at uh, the pattern, multicolor. And this is what we're after, right? So, but, but we don't know why quarter wave was working as well as it was. So we can change it back and take another look at it. But um, well, I mean, actually, most Yagi's the elements are spaced about a quarter wave. Yeah. And they, yeah. they and they become additive because you have a delay in phase and the physical spacing, which makes them additive because they're phased a half wave because they're phased mm -hmm. a quarter wave apart. That right. actually makes sense. Okay. So let's let's change this back to quarter wave minus r two divided by two. And then we'll put a director in there. Okay, now we're Rem going to have it. Have remember, in the, in the case of a par parasitic element, the second element is, you know, a current is induced on the second element by the dipole field. Right. This is all. It's, it's all magic. It's all magic. It's all hocus pocus. Yeah, it's magic. That's why they use egg yagis for FM. Yeah, that's right. And now instead of minus oh x x one, we're going to go minus r two times point nine five. And then for spacing, we'll do r two divided by two. We'll make it a quarter wave out front. And the height will be the same. Are these entries case sensitive? Uh, I don't think the variable names are. The numbers obviously don't have case. No, I don't think they are case sensitive. <coughs> oh, I see we're doing another thing here. Mm. Should that be minus? Yeah, okay. Minus. I've been doing three mo 3D modeling for, <laughs> I wrote my own 3D CAD software many years ago. <laughs> so all, all this XYZ stuff is just second, it's just mm -hmm. automatic for me. H. <clears throat> Okay, we're saving that because we don't want to have to type all that in again. Anybody need a little more time? Yeah, just a sec. R two slash slash two H W. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, save. Yep. Calculate. We'll do a frequency sweep just for fun. Oops. All right, where's my typo? As we add more wires, oh. it takes longer to calculate, especially the number of segments. Segments kind of define the accuracy to some extent. Takeoff angle still kind of high up around 60, 55. Oops. 
Yeah. I've got some crossed wires here. That means I've got a sign probably wrong. You want to see the line? Here you go. Okay, so wire six in Y1, it's not a minus sign for the. No. Oh, okay. Oops. No, the that's that that tells it how far out front of the driven element. So one's behind the driven element, and one's in front of the driven element. Oops. So this is half wave spacing right now with no, divided it's quarter by two. It's qu divided you by two. You switched it back to divided by two, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that R two divided by two is quarter wave. And you know the easy. I mean, there there's another way to do it too. If you're not going to have it be set by a variable, you can just create a variable that's that's independent of everything else and just call it. You know, like yeah. uh, spacing. Like, reflector spacing and another one called director spacing yeah and set them in your uh symbols and then when you run optimizer you can actually optimize like forward gain with based on those two variables and just you know because you can actually mul you can actually optimize based on multiple variables at once yeah it, it takes longer and yeah but you know you're basically it, it's just running, you know, iteration after iteration and trying things because it doesn't know any better. And, yeah. you know, it'll it'll do one and say, oh, you know, the SWR went up to 26. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Clearly, that was not a good one. <laughs> yeah, you can actually de define a JPOL roughly and have it optimize everything, spacing. and. But in the case of a JPOL, it all has to be real wires. You can't use transmission lines. So now so. what's cool is having, you know, knowing this kind of stuff, you know, when you, if, if people look at, uh, you know, look at an antenna that you, let's say, go and buy, somebody will say, you know, for sale, you know, for $800, computer optimized Yagi. Well, <laughs> that's exactly what we're doing here. And we're doing it for free. Right. And of, often you'll see... Uh, Antenna claims and ads are based on modeling, not on actual measurement, because it's a lot easier to measure it in this program than it is to uh, actually go out with a field strength meter. And I, I read that somebody has programmed their uh, their drone with a field strength meter. And they've flown a pattern, and that's one way to actually measure the actual <clears throat> um, field strength at different distances. So, okay, so here we are. Let's look at our SWR. Wow, we're way off in frequency, so we could optimize that again. Let's go ahead and do that. So notice that, again... Notice the only variables that show up here are the variables that are defined as with digits, not other variables. So you have to make the, any variables that you want to optimize, they have to be primary variables, not based on other variables. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. We'll get it tuned up. And then we'll do the far field pattern. And we'll look at the, the uh, color. <clears throat> Optimized. Okay, and now our our uh, velocity factor went got bigger. We're going to go ahead and update our NEC file. And close that. And now I'm going to do calculate our field pattern. And you optimized what in that se sequence? I optimized the velocity factor, VF. Which but in reality, the... you're not changing that though. No, it, but what it in does, it changes the effective all, all element I, length. I'm just uh, optimizing the SWR. 
Right. That's right. what that's what that was for. But basically what it's doing is it's changing the apparent <laughs> element length. And that's why, you know, I mean, because the velocity factor is an intrinsic function of the material that you're using. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And in reality, I've been using like a quarter of the radiator length as the spacing. And really it should be um, quarter in free space. I should be, there should be a different, uh, should be doing quarter of L versus quarter of VL. But this is a class, who cares? <laughs> uh, so here's, here's my, um, I'm going to show, show our currents. And I'm going to show both magnitude and phase. And that's kind of interesting. Okay. And some antennas, this is very important. In fact, you, you could probably optimize for this with the optimizer. Anyway, um, now we're going to look at the pattern. I'm going to go multicolor where it says hide pattern. I'm going to choose multicolor. And one thing that I've noticed about directional antennas, you see how broad it is across the bottom here? That's pretty good. If you run that uh, hex beam model that I put on my website, you'll see it's not nearly as broad across the front there, which means the, um, <clears throat> that the, uh, the main lobe is narrower. Is that true? Yeah. Well, the, it, it, the, uh, effect efficiency as a radiator drops off quickly from the center. This, this is pretty broad here. And maybe that's what makes a, a Yagi as good as it is. If you do the hex beam, you'll see it's a lot, it's a lot narrower in the middle here. It, it comes in a lot narrower, it, which means you have to be pointed a lot closer to the station you actually want to uh, communicate with. Hey, Gary. Yeah. Another thing, can, could you, um show the effect of basically taking this Yagi and putting it in free space by eliminating the ground altogether. Uh, yeah. Cause okay. I think that, cause you know, like if you think about how some, you know, some measurements are taken, it's by an antenna in an anechoic chamber with no ground reflections and no losses. And well, you can't get rid of ground in an anechoic chamber. No, well, no, but you could take an antenna and put it 20 wavelengths above the ground. Yeah, so if you're doing a UHF antenna or a VHF antenna, it works. So we'll change this to free space. I'm going to save it. I'm going to go ahead and do far field again. So now, whoops, I'm going to change. Oh, okay, so here, something happened. I'm going to change this to currents, both, multicolor. Okay, so yeah, so there you go. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> That's funny, it turned Gary? out. Yeah. So, sorry, is the multicolor just shown on the, the origin axis for for optics? Because isn't it really positioned up on the antenna? I'm not following. Yeah, yeah it I, is. I've often wondered that myself. It's so um, you can still see the wires. I, okay. I think you have to treat the or yeah the mathematical origin in here as the center of your antenna. Yeah. Okay, but in a but, practical sense, this is in free space, so that multicolor would be up at the antenna height, right? Yes. It's just for optics, they do Yeah, this. definitely. Thanks. Well, and, and yeah. when you think about it in the, in the, you know, in the extreme, you know, at a long distance, the antenna looks as though it's on the ground anyway, compared to, you know, when you're a thousand miles away, if the antenna is okay. 25 feet yeah. in the air, who cares? It's, nothing. it's basically yeah. on the ground. Okay. Ground is just another element of the antenna. Yeah. 
question and the pattern the pattern on the left there your f4 pattern is is that's basically a section where can you just kind of move your mouse if, you know that the, the the pattern the f4 yeah is that just um, a section horizontally or vertically is that what's throwing us off of this the no, angle is it's rotation around the the vertical axis that that one okay, variable it's changes. Plan, plan view. Okay. Yeah, phi phi is a rotation around the vertical axis. Barry. Okay, yeah. So, um, is there any way to tell the the angle? So, on each wire, can we tell the angle of that? You know, that graph of that plane that's being defined by the the um, the current along the wire. Is there any way to tell? Because sometimes visually, it's kind of hard for me to. To figure out what was that 90 degrees or you know or something you know whatever. on that on that phasing if you use that um both that'll show you the actual phase of the current yeah so as you have well to, as the magnitude yeah so phasing is shown as basically a snapshot obviously this power is being radiated in all directions but it's showing see so it's really just useful for comparing the direction on the different elements Right. So, it, but to to know what the actual angle is. Right. Words, uh, that how that bow is rotated, or you know, is rotated around the wire. Right. So yeah, here it's it may be clear because everything is parallel. But if you were doing things at angles, you know, it would be different. Mm -hmm. right. And what one want to know. You know what it is right so the reason these are flip are pointing upwards is because this one's pointing downwards they're reacting um they might even be reacting to signal bouncing off the ground coming back up um yeah i i can't help you a lot with that i haven't really played with that very much i I've, I've mostly modeled collinear uh, vertic verticals mm -hmm. with phasing um so there's one more task um that we can do we can um oh look at that now now the front to back ratio is greater at the higher frequency i'm going through the uh the pattern and you by the way you can uh when you do your optimization Okay, okay. When you do your optimization, one of the things you can operate, you one of the things you can optimize for is front to back. Now, there's front to back and there's front to rear, and they're different. Um, I'll leave that for, for further exploration. <laughs> but you can also optimize for gain or, um, and it knows what to do with each of these values. It knows that rn is bad and xn is well you want xn you it knows that rn is bad and xn should should be 50 ohms because we defined that you can optimize for efficiency because you know radiation efficiency is not always highest at the lowest swr hey gary can i yeah. add something real quick sure so one thing that was interesting was when we ran the um when we ran the picture of that three element yagi over free space the forward right. gain was about six d six dbi right. when it's placed over a ground it's almost 11. Oh. ground reflection right yeah yeah i mean that's that's one of the things that's calculated into yeah. this and thing. that's that is very much tied to frequency this this antenna is 32 feet long and it's 32 feet off the ground if if you were doing a 40 meter antenna it'd be 66 feet long and in most cases a wire antenna is not going to be 66 feet off the ground some people do that but um this pattern would change quite a bit if it was closer than a half wave to the ground. But you can see we're getting some pretty good gain here on this Yagi, especially low angle gain. It's is pretty good, 0.95 dB. That's if you want to talk to people far away. But you don't have to go up very high before it get 
before the gain gets up to seven. That's yeah. So this is a good yagi. Um, so the last task is to model the coax shield. As everybody knows, coax shield interacts with an antenna. And um, hey, hey, Gary. Yeah. Can I can I share my screen real quick? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. I just wanted everybody to see this antenna that I modeled, which I actually built. Can everybody see that picture? Mm -hmm. This is what I have for 160 meters in my yard. And it's not a great antenna, but it's a good antenna. And it doesn't look like anything that I would have ever come up with. And therein lies, you know, kind of like the benefit of doing this computer modeling. The fact that it actually, you know, I mean, okay, so it's peak gain is like negative 0.3 dBi or something like that, but I'm on 160 meters. I actually have something that can work. Yeah. And so, it radiates out the middle of that yeah, vertical wire. It does. Yeah. It's essentially a bottom fed with two legs sticking out of it and a capacitance hat which I never would have thought of doing. Anyway. Great. Okay, so we, we're having a little bit too much fun here now. We're gonna go ahead and model a um, coax shield um, because it can actually throw, throw the balance of this dipole off. We're going to go edit input file. We're going to throw in another wire. And this will be seven. And the number of segments here is probably not terribly important, but we'll go ahead and do 201 because we like that number. Geometry X. X is going to be minus F2. And y will be zero. This is just a starting point. Z1 will be zero. Something magical happens when you connect it to the ground. Uh, X2 will also be minus F2. And X, Y2 will be zero, and Z2 will be zero. Uh oh. Uh -oh. We're going to make that zero. And this one over here, actually, Z1 should be H. Yeah. Oops. OK, so what's going to happen now is we're running a wire from the left side. Actually. Oh, right. Yeah, this is correct. I, I was missing wire one, so I couldn't really see. So. We're running down from the left end of the feed, feeder wire. We're, we're basically grounding the left side of the dipole. That's what we're doing, running a wire straight to the ground. We'll say that. I actually haven't tried this before, so this, this is the part that's fun for me. We'll try a frequency sweep just to see. This will take the wire a diameter. Oh, look at that. Division by zero. What's the wire diameter? Uh, Call it W again. Zero. Goes away. I have to start up just a second. Wire diameter. Oh, yeah. The, that's probably the problem. I didn't set the wire diameter. Okay. The wire diameter should be W. Just because we don't care. Uh, I got an alarm. Wires four and seven are crossing or not connected. So I'm going to go edit. So make sure yours looks like mine. So you don't have to adjust the trans line in the... Um... Okay, so the deal is that the trans line, like I said, is a perfect trans line. It's not actually real. It just delivers power. It doesn't interact with anything. 
And that's why we need to add this field. Um, because the field does interact with things. You got a wire crossing error. Okay, let me see. I do too. Okay, so let's see. X1, X2. That might be because it's... Okay, so what we're going to do for X1 minus point... I moved mine point oh two off of it. Yeah, we'll do that. Minus F2 minus point zero two. Oh, actually where it meets the, it has to be in the same place at the top, not at the bottom. Yeah, so, so this X2 should be minus F2 minus 0 0.02, but this should be just minus F2 because it's got to connect up with that wire. It's got to be in the same place. So this is minus F2, this minus F2, that H and this H are the same. So it'll be in the same place. So I'm going to save this. We'll look at it. We'll just look at it in the geometry window first. So down here, Wires one and seven are crossing or not connected. Hmm. Yeah, so these are not, you see the trans line and the wire are not in the same place now. That's good. But up here it needs, needs to be. Okay, that looks right to me. I'll just try running it and see if I get the same error as everybody else is. So what's the difference between a left wire and a right wire and a coax shield? Are we duplicating something there? Um, this is not in line with the radiator. This is dropping straight down to the ground. And any wire that ends up on the ground gets grounded. Perfect ground. <laughs> and I'll explain that in a second. And and that's why you're calling it the shield, because it's you're only because you're grounding it. Yeah, I'm trying to mimic maybe where it would fall, but yeah, this is taking a while. At one time this can 12 years ago, this computer was pretty fast. <laughs> hey, it still beats me having to let it run all the way, all, let it run overnight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so if you look over here in the main window, it says ground plane symmetry wires for Z equals zero connected. What that means is if a wire ends up at zero uh, in a Z coordinate, it will be connected to the ground. Um, this won't work in free space. I mean, free space, it won't be connected to anything. Did you have to specify a perfect ground or you can leave it real ground? Should, should be real ground. Okay. No, shouldn't be perfect ground. So, so what you did was ground the coax at the bottom? Yeah, this wire. The coax shield. Right. Okay. So this wire. There's and a wire because the here. coax, because the coax shield is parallel to the coax essentially, and it yeah. connects to one leg of the dipole. Yeah, that's what makes it. So down here. Oh. It hits the ground. That's the feed point. So this is ground. where. Okay. So this is where. It's useful to know something about like having bent wires because you can have, can, I, can anyone see my, see my picture? I don't know if I'm on there. Or I not. see your picture. Okay. No, um, I, I don't see your screen. Yeah. Yeah. But you see me. I see you. So if I, let me, let me do uh here we go. I'm going to share real quick. So 
Oh, stop it. Crazy computer. There we go. So basically what we've got is we've got one leg of the dipole here and one leg of the dipole here. And you've got, let's call it the center conductor and the shield. And essentially what you have to have is this. But in this particular case, this goes to ground. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just... the, 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 basically this <clears throat> point right here They all have, all three of those wires have to end at the exact same point. Right. If they end at the exact same point, they're all connected at that node. Right. And this is where it's useful when you start understanding the geometry to say, okay, well, this is really made of two wires connected at a node in space. Yeah. In at my one case, particular point. In my case, I just moved the ground over 20, 20 millimeters. I just moved where it hits the ground 20 millimeters over. Yeah, or you could do it as Gary was saying. Let's. You could do it like this. Oops. From again, from that node down to here. Yeah. But the key is that all those wires have to meet at the exact same point in space. Right. Or else they're not connected. Like you can do one that comes here. Yeah. That's not connected, unless you've specified that one wire ends, you know, this is number, like, this is number one, and this is number two, and this is number three, where one and two are really the same wire, but they, but they meet in space at that point. Then you can connect the third wire to it. Yeah. Yeah, they have to meet it. They have to be separate wires. Only the ends can connect. So, yeah. Your red wire that you drew at an angle was what we just added. Straight. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's. Fun. Let's, it's fun with. It's basically fun with geometry. So what the point of this is? This this wire is pretty much ninety degrees to the dipole. We're going to go ahead and look at the pattern now, but then we're going to move this move this connection to the ground. We're going to move it way over here. And we're going to see, look at the currents and the pattern. Isn't, don't you have a half wave on Z? Or is that a quarter yeah, wave? Yeah, I do. It's half wave so on it's Z. A, so it's 180 degrees then. Yeah, that's 180 degrees okay. there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this window really distorts things some. So yeah, it's a half wave from front to back. Yeah, it's a half wave high. Yeah, this window is kind of weird. If you make it a different size, sometimes it'll it won't be. Uh, it won't it won't show things equally anymore. It'll show X and Y and Z differently. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go ahead and look at the patterns on this. Our looks like we're we're tuned pretty well. So running that ground, our shield is pretty good. But if I move this, this over here, we're going to see a distortion and it'll probably affect the SWR. So we're going to um, go ahead and do a star field pattern. Not taking too long. Okay, now we're gonna show 3D viewer. And we're gonna look at the currents. Oh, look at that, all the currents are going up now. Oh, wait, till I show the phasing. Uh, <laughs> till I show the phasing. Okay, so And you can see there's currents on the shield. Can you see that? I'll zoom in on that. See, you that's want, why you, that's you don't why want you, current on the shield. No, it's not very much. This is why you want to model the shield because um, in some end, if this is off balance, there'll be a lot more, um, like if I move this, this 
feed point over, make it off center, you'd see a lot more current on the shield. Um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to modify the geometry. Instead of putting the bottom right under there, we're going to go minus R2. So now we're going to be out the end of the radiator. If we look at, I'm going to save this. So you see where the shield is hooked up now? This is how you would actually model if, if you're wondering about if the shield, if the coax is interacting with the antenna or the feed line for that matter, a, a, an open feed line would, would behave very similarly if one side is connected to the ground. Um, so we're gonna go ahead, we'll just do our far field pattern. I, we could have looked at SWR, it probably affected the SWR too. If you hook a wire up to both sides, can you make a multi-band like a 20 meter Yagi and a 40 meter inverted V off the same feed point? You mean a fan dipole, yeah, sure. Oh, uh, yeah, you can, well, you have a Yagi and a, and a dipole. And a fan combined. dipole. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you, you probably have to watch out on 15 and 40. You don't want to combine those probably, but. Um, so let's look at our patterns now. But now, what if the ends of the antenna are grounded? Quote, uh, grounded. It might not make a difference. Yeah. Well, you ground rhombics and stuff yeah. like that, right? Hmm. Terminate with the resistor. Yeah. Right. That's different. Yeah. OK, that looks kind of OK. See, we have a little more current on the coax now. See, that? that's more prominent. And now, interestingly, Gary, why don't you change the frequency on which it's operating, just no, for just, fun? Just a minute. First, we're going to look at the pattern. <laughs> okay, still looks pretty symmetrical. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. Okay, that's because we don't have too much current here. If we if we attach, if if we move the center of the dipole over, then we'd have a real problem. Off center fed. Dipoles have generally have a lot of current on the coax. So yeah, this is all. Let's look at the vertical. Yeah, okay. So now you can see a little asymmetry there. Not a lot, just a little bit. Oh, by the way, um, this is the way it's supposed to work. As you go around here you can see where there's a pink line here and that's showing, it's trying to show where that line is hitting the blue line. Okay. Um, does anybody have any important questions? I, I can stick around a little longer if people have have a lot of questions, but is anybody stuck on anything? On that 3D viewer yeah. you have right there, uh, it seemed like you were able to zoom in on the wires earlier. Was that okay, easy? so using your middle button, or if you don't have a middle button, holding down both right and left buttons and scrolling up and down, it'll zoom in. Okay, got it, thanks. And if you want to um, drag it, use your right button. And whereas this window, <laughs> to zoom in and out, you hit page up and page down, you can still, you can drag it around with your right button. But um, yeah, so anyway, there's another window too that they, there's like three windows that behave a little differently. Well, Thanks. great. Sounds like we made some progress. Now I'm, I, I can hang around for a while if anybody has any questions about their own antennas or anything like that. It would still be interesting to see a Moxon if you have time to. Oh, yeah. So do that. 
I'm if, going, if, if that's okay with the group. Yeah, we can do that. So um, let's take. I might end up uh, disappearing here, but I want to thank both of you guys uh, and whoever else supported this. It was excellent. I appreciate the opportunity to pop in and, Good. Uh, club activity. Oh, we appreciate the opportunity for everybody to drop in. It was <laughs> great. I mean, this Good. is, the, I mean, this, this, this is actually a lot of fun. Gary, you do you have a, it. do you have a canned presentation for like playing at a club meeting? This one. Okay. <laughs> it'll, it'll be on three, three hours. All three hours. <laughs> I have a, yeah, you can edit it any way you want. It, it'll be up under a creative commons license on YouTube pretty soon. Cause I can upload pretty darn fast. Um, but you know, a, 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 because 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 it's it really helps to be interactive. You know, we don't know what problems are going to come up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, I I mean, I I just downloaded the software because Gary said actually Gary and Gary. There's another Gary AF7NX here in in Eugene. They said, you know, you really ought to try this. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, and I started fumbling around with it, and I said, you know what? Can somebody just give me like a 15 minute tutorial on things to do and things to not do. And, you know, given that I just started pushing buttons and like, Oh, I can make wires. Oh, okay. I can, I can do this. Oh, I guess I have to put a source there. And, you know, basically, you know, ho the, the hope is that now having gone through this, now you just start connecting wires and seeing what happens. And you know, try try using the try using the symbols for variables, and then do optimization of your feed point, or op optimization of uh, you know optimization of the the length of the the length of a particular radiator. And you know, like for me, I I I honestly didn't know if that if I was using um, you know vinyl insulated wire. Oh. Well, that's why that antenna works. You know, I look out in the backyard and there it is. Squirrels haven't chewed it up amazingly. And it's up in, it's up 90 feet in a tree. And uh, that's the only way that I could get on 160. And again, I never would have, I never would have come up with an antenna that looked like a T or a letter I. Okay. So the, the easy neck or the other one that's free these days the pro version mm -hmm. much different than this i mean is it just a probably a different interface so you understand if you understand the concepts here then you understand a lot of it the interface is pretty different um even like the plots this one will show the uh the, at the outer edge of the plot it'll show um, it'll show the maximum gain loop, mm -hmm. whereas the other, it'll show, it'll say, well, that's, let's call that zero and we'll subtract from that as you go mm -hmm. in. Okay. So it's, I, I think this one's a little more logical and I like the variables. Easy neck doesn't let you do the variables. It has, a, it's a lot tighter on certain things. I really but, like but, the variables. But really, the magic of this whole thing is the fact that there's this numerical electromagnetics code that's running at the core of both, which is essentially written a long time ago and, mm -hmm. well, and is essentially unchanged for many, many, many years. You know? The historic for NRAD and the guy that wrote that worked in a building next to me. So. He, he walked around in slip-on shoes and kind of bumped into walls, but uh, he, he wrote the NEC or was a participant in writing the NEC. He worked in the uh, antenna optimization lab for shipboard, you know, uh, where they have multiple antennas next to each other. He worked in that lab where they have the great big outdoor antenna with the Yaggies on the, on the hemispherical arcs over mm -hmm. the, over the brass models of the ships and all bit. So if if people want to watch me modify this into a Moxon. Yes, please. And can you upload that Moxon model? Well, it's not a Moxon yet. Oh. What I, what I did ah. what I did is I saved another copy of that file from the website. It's called Dipole. 
Yes. So save that as Moxon, and we'll start from scratch. Is a, a Moxon a, a Moxon is a two element beam, right? But it is kind of like a like a rec, like a rectangle. Yeah. Yeah, it has but sides. It has the ends are bent in towards each other. Yeah, yeah it's kind of an advantage short. of that, and the and the hex beam is that they're quieter antennas because they're more like a loop antenna because the high impedance ends are near each other and they interact. Mm -hmm. And right. it's a it's a quieter to e uh, man made e field. Yeah, and then the other thing that's really popular right now is these loop. I can't remember if they're LFA loops uh, for the for the uh, low noise for the uh, Yagi's. They're instead of feeding using a dipole, they'll feed it with a loop. Huh. Um, that seems to be more efficient. And it's almost like, like a, a little well, box on half wave like, or a full wave, half wave um, loops. No, you'll have to look it up. I think it's called okay. LFA Yogi. loop fed, loop fed yeah. Yogi. antenna. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, you can find models on the internet. There's sure. some some sites that have lots of models. Um, there's even models that come with Cornet too. So I'm going to open, I saved that file. You know, mm -hmm. we've modified this dipole file a lot now. It's not a yeah. dipole anymore. Now it's a- It's a Yagi. <laughs> right. So I downloaded that file again and I named it Moxon. And we'll open that guy up and uh, we'll, we'll be back at ground zero here. Back to the dipole. Yeah, and then we'll turn it into a Moxon. Now, a Moxon typically part of the end would be folded back. Correct. But it has to be shorter. There's a certain ratio. Uh, yeah. the, the two arms come out at 40 degrees. So whatever that ratio is, I don't know of a offhand. Right. Um, on some level, we could optimize that. We could just plug in wires and tell it to optimize it for a certain frequency and see what it comes up with. But we've got two of these guys, we've got a reflector too. And so there's some interaction going on there and I think that they're not equal. Uh, they, the sides are the same distance from the center, but, but the depth of the radiator and the depth of the re reflector are different. Um, in other words, the side lengths are different. In fact, and then and I think there's even a space between the side lengths. There is. Yeah. But I'm going to show you how to hook up wires. That's primarily what I'm going to do uh -huh. right now. I'm not, I'm not so much going to show you how to make a Moxon, but I'm going to show you how to hook up wires. And you can take formulas from the web and turn it into a Moxon. So I'm going to go edit input file. Here's our original dipole. And we're going to stick a wire on the side. And um, hey, Gary, yeah, yeah. Can I can I show something really quick? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, one one thing that I find interesting about this also is that you can also have angles. And notice I have cosines and sines in here. Mm -hmm. So if you have things that are bent at certain angles, you can actually use trigonometric functions in here as well in your calculations. Yeah. So like I have bend equals thirty. That's in degrees. Hmm. That antenna happens to be that, which people might recognize as a, you know, five dollar quarter wave vertical that goes up on the roof. Mm -hmm. And I had it optimize the downward angle. Yeah. So let me talk about this antenna for okay. a second. I'll leave it up. Oh, you want me to leave it up? Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a, a point I want to make. There you so, go. So, you know, a dipole, pretty much all you can do is uh, tune the length. The length affects the, uh, the, uh, the frequency that it resonates at. But on a, let me see the geometry window. I just need to see the geometry window. So here on these uh, ground plane antennas, there's this cool thing that happens. If, 
if, if you built this with level um, radials, then it would have one impedance. About 36 but, ohms. Yeah, but if you bend these down, the impedance starts going up. And if you bend them down just right, they get to 50 ohms. What that means is that this, if you wanted to tune the frequency on this, you'd be changing the length of the top radiator and these radials. They should generally be the same length. But if you're gonna change the impedance, you would bend these angles down. So what that means is that this antenna is, is tunable both for frequency and for impedance. And that's pretty cool. Now on a Yagi, a Yagi is also tunable for both frequency and impedance. You change the size of the Yagi, it changes the frequency. But on a Yagi, you, I'm sure you've all seen, they have various kinds of feeds, the, the, the delta feed, a gamma feed, various things like this. And they have this movable element like on a gamma feed, you can move this element in and out until your impedance is matched. Well, that's pretty cool. That means you can get a perfect 50 ohm match and right on the frequency you want. Whereas this, this dipole that we're starting with, the closest we're gonna get is gonna be 1.25, 1.5, something like that, because the voltage isn't right in the middle. Um, in order, you see this voltage over here in the main window? That should be 70.71 volts. Um, when, you, when, when you're there, you're at, you're at 50 ohms. There's a relationship between 50 ohms and this voltage. And um, so antennas that let you tune both the frequency and the impedance have an advantage because you can, you can put more power out. Obviously 1.5 to one is good enough. And that's what most people end up with with a dipole. But um, this antenna and some others, I've learned that uh, a J-pole is also tunable that way. By, by changing the length of the loop, the U-shaped part below the feed point, you can actually tune the impedance. So you tune the, the radiator and the match, you tune the radiator a half wave, tune the match at a quarter wave, and then you, you can actually have, it's almost like a beta match down at the bottom, the loop, this U-shaped piece below the feed point, you can change that up or down and you can actually get a perfect 50 ohm match there too. And that's very different from the storm, standard formula you'll see online for, for a J-pole. It'll be way more than a quarter wavelength. Um, so as you see right here, in order to, in order to minimize my SWR, it turns out that the right angle is about 34 degrees mm -hmm. tip down. So by, by doing parametric stuff and having variables in there, it greatly increases the power of your ability to optimize things. The more things you put in parameters, the more you can change, the more you, you, op do you optimize the, the bend parameter there. Uh, yeah, I optimized the SWR. I, 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 mod I, I had it modify only the bend to optimize my SWR. I could also have it optimize the bend and the length. Yeah. Okay. So, so anyway, um, it's a very, very powerful tool. So anyway, the way you will connect a wire to another wire is you, um, you just give it the same coordinates on one end. So for instance, we have our left wire at the top here, wire number one. If we copy, if we just make this R minus R2, zero, H, and now the other end can go wherever you want. One end is connected to the left end of the left wire. The other end can go wherever you want. Um, so let's run it. Our Y is going to change minus R2. We'll make this one meter. 
and Z2 is gonna be H. And then we'll make it same wire stuff. Left, I'll call it a left return. And if we save that, go down here, we can see it here. And we'll, we'll just go ahead and run this, see what that does. Um, their frequency, I'll do the far field. Now, instead of calling that one meter, you can't optimize that. So you have to set that up as a variable. If you okay, want to optimize so, it, uh -huh. so if what, you want to use it as a variable for optimization, yes. Yeah, so okay. what I ran into is that the disk, the length, this length is too different from the length that it connects to. Yeah. So I'm going to make, I'm going to enter set of one segment. I'll just enter 10. That'll probably mm -hmm. fix it. But ideally, I would kind of either fix that correctly or turn on auto segmentation. If you just don't want to mess with that stuff, turn on auto segmentation. So now it, now it finished. And I should point out that you can look at currents on here as mm -hmm. well as, so there's your current profile. Notice basically that it just runs so, off the end there. So you could metal, uh, model a bent dipole as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can model them, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So probably that's all I should show you is how to connect wires. Sure. And you can do the same thing for a fan dipole. If you've got a straight wire for 40 meters and you want to drop down for 20 meters, just run a little wire at 45 degrees and then run out from there. And that little 45 degree wire, if it'll you, it can be part of the whole length if you want. You know, I'll let you play with that. So a loop antenna, uh, basically at that height, you just, you're probably putting four segments and then the last segment, you may not <laughs> make the connection. So, right. so something like this. Yeah, you want a lap. Yeah, you want a gap. Mm -hmm. So something like this where I have like, um, a connection right here and a connection right here. Here's my feed line. Mm -hmm. I basically will have a, a name for this point right here. And I'll, you know, I'll have a, a basically a position in space for this point right here and this point right here. And then I can go through and say, okay, if I know what my L is, my total length, right, then this, this right here is L over two minus the height whatever the height is. Mm -hmm. And so long as basically then, if I say that I start at this point right here, then I know that this point right here is, you know, whatever the, the top part of the antenna, the height is. Right. Right. I can say that it's, you know, whatever the, the, the horizontal position and the vertical position is, and the same thing on this end, and I can change the height and, you know, the, the H value, and they can all be parameterized and I can say, go find, you know, give me, get me 50 ohms. Mm -hmm. And because they're all parametric values, it can change every single one of them. And, you know, I don't care if it takes, you know, six hours to run, you know, I mean, obviously I'll try it with fewer segments first, but if it takes an hour to run, fine. You know, if it comes up with something that I can use, then good. So let's let's say you're looking for 200 ohms because you yeah. probably put a four, yes, the one you, balen on it or something, right? And you can set your value of your characteristic impedance to that. Mm -hmm. Gary, do you want to show that? Yeah. Um, is that in your uh, yeah, symbols? Let me see where it is here. Others. There is a place to plug that in. Because um, I sometimes do 450. Yeah, it's actually at the source here. See this Z zero here? Ah, uh, there. There under settings. There's also well, uh, no, under settings no, on the there. main on the main menu. There's a settings characteristic, characteristic impedance. There it is. So you just change that now. If, for instance, you're going to model an infed half wave, you would just set that for twenty four fifty, or whatever you want to use. Yep. Forty nine to one is twenty four fifty. You just plug that in there, and then you don't even have to worry about the transformer. 
Just right. feed, feed the wire at the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So, you know what? This was really excellent. I appreciate what you've done here. So okay. you Thank got you. me over a lot of uh, startup issues. <laughs> Good. And I, um, I imagine some people, I, after I, after I make a video like this, sometimes I'll go back and watch it myself. Well, like I watched on my last video because I wanted to see what I could have done better. And I, I'm glad I, it seems like I did a lot better on this one. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think this is the fourth time we've done this. Is that right, Gary? Yeah, Third or I fourth? Think so, yeah. Yeah. Fourth, I think. Okay, well, I'm going to stop. And, and we, we guarantee that you'll get your money's worth or we'll give you your money back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but well, double your money back. Double your money back. That's right. It's great having you all here. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you so much. Hey, Gary. Sure appreciate when, it. It was awesome. Gary, send me the link when you uh, when you put it up and I'll distribute okay. it to anybody and I can go ahead and post it on the reflector too. Okay. And, uh, well, a lot of these, a lot of people here are not on the reflector as well. Right. So. I know. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. I'll post it to the reflector. You can get it off of there. Okay. And uh, yeah. And I'm probably not going to edit it at all. So <laughs> it'll be lame in places. And I don't necessarily <laughs> have an email for everybody who's here. So I, I, I'll get it through Dick. He'll pass okay. it along. All right. All right, thank thanks, you all. Gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all right yeah. thanks everybody. See you Gary, there. thanks, See Gary. You thank you. Yeah, now, now go use the antenna that you built. <laughs> all right. We will have thank another you. class. We'll have another class someday. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right.